This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, PreSonus, Spectra 1964, and API Audio. So get ready to rock. Part of the responsibility of everyone playing together is not just to individually make themselves sound great and own their sound, but it's to support everybody else too. And if you're really listening, you're going to do this anyway. Like if the drummer is doing a cool fill, lay out, Rhodes player. Yeah. Let the drummer have his moment. Yeah. You know, you're going to complicate it. Um, and it's going to be it's going to be slightly less cool a lot of the times. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you feel like the fast pace of computer tech has made your studio Mac obsolete, then think again. OWC is your personal studio tech for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and use Macs perfect for recording and mixing. Why ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with the Mac you've already got? Learn how to supercharge your studio and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC.com so that you can focus on making great music. If you want a digital audio workstation that will give life to your music from sketching a new idea to composing, editing, mixing, and mastering a finished record, then you want Studio One from PreSonus. Studio One is easy to use with intuitive drag and drop simplicity, making it great for beginners, yet flexible and powerful for experienced producers. Whether creating beats, recording a band, or composing a blockbuster film soundtrack, you will find everything you need to create your masterpiece. Download your free version of Studio One Prime and get started now at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is David Rogers, a California native. David is one of the most exciting talents in Nashville's jazz scene today, currently an active member of Keb Moe's band as the keyboardist. He has also recorded on numerous records, including Keb's Grammy-winning Oklahoma in 2019. David has toured and performed worldwide at the Montreux Jazz Festival, North Sea Jazz Festival, and the Playboy Jazz Festival. He also has a Bachelor's of Music degree in classical and jazz piano performance from Vanderbilt University's Blair School of Music and a Master of Music degree in commercial composition from Belmont University. His compositions have been performed and recorded internationally, including guest appearances in the 2018 Jazz Education Network's Young Composers Showcase, where the U.S. Airman of Note played his winning band composition, as well as in Canada, where he was invited as a guest artist to the BAMP Center's International Workshop in Jazz and Creative Music. In addition to being an active Korg-endorsed artist, he was also a finalist for Rowley's first ever International Next Awards, for which he was invited to London to perform as a soloist. He has released two albums, the 2017 debut project, Songs for a Generation, which I mixed, as well as his 2019 album, Doorways, which he recorded and mixed with me right here as well. Please welcome the incredibly talented David Rogers to Recording Studio Rockstars. David, are you ready to rock, dude? I sure am, man. Thanks for having me. It's awesome to have you hanging out here and being on the podcast, too. What a pleasure, man. Yeah, this is a pleasure for me, too, man. This is this is familiar stomping grounds. We've been here for, I don't know how many hours, probably many. days, probably weeks at this point. <laughs> um, first off, let me just say, Rockstar, is that it has been a true, true honor for me to have been able to work with David making records. I feel like there are these moments in your recording career when a, a truly somebody who you recognize as being a, a significant artist, somebody with um, real skills that are going to stand out, comes your way, and you get a chance to make a record with them, Dave, Dave, David, <laughs> you're one of those people. <laughs> wow, man, thank in you. my world. So, man, it's been amazing to work with you. Yeah, um, likewise. Yeah, tell us a little bit more, you know, in your own words about, you know, briefly and or quickly how you got from starting out to 
being here, you know, right now in Nashville. Absolutely. All these things going on. Yeah, I grew up in Southern California. Um, both parents are engineers. No one in my family is a musician now, at all. Now, hold on. When you say engineers yeah. on this show, you got to <laughs> clarify what we mean. That's a great point. Um, math science people. Um, all right, so not recording for engineers. JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, those kinds of engineers. And wow. uh, no one, yeah, no one in my family is a musician to any extent. And my mom started me on piano lessons when I was age four as a way to encourage um, some sort of discipline in my life. I apparently have always been a rebellious child. And <laughs> um, and the music is just the, mo- the most recent rebellion, I guess. Um, but yeah, you know, I just really fell in love with it. I uh, really took to it. Grew up playing classical music exclusively. Uh, started experimenting with improvisation, uh, maybe around age 10 or so. Didn't know what jazz was, but anytime we turned on 88.1, K jazz in Southern California, I'd hear this music that sounded random, but it it all f- kind of worked together, and so that intrigued me. Because you were studying classical, it was like exactly, yeah, you know, only like, only classical music, they, and so they tape you down to the piano bench, kind of thing. Right? <laughs> that's sort of, yeah, that sort of yeah. training discipline. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, I think the, I, I think being exposed to things that were challenging to me was was good for me, um, but I'm sure I resisted along the way. And um, in some ways, probably when I was younger, uh, my mom probably had to encourage me <laughs> to practice, we'll put that lightly, encourage me. And um, anything short of um, duct taping me to the piano bench. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I really fell in love with it. I think I've always loved music. And I think the thing I've always loved most is just listening to music more so than actually playing it. What, do you, what, do you, what was your exposure to music? I mean, were your parents way into listening to the hi-fi? I mean, were you were they playing classical music on your summer trips to Area 51? You know, that <laughs> yeah. Kind of thing? Um, well, my mom grew up listening to the oldies, you know, Motown, um, 50s, 60s, 70s, music of her childhood. And so I grew up on that. Um, my dad loves all kinds of music, but he really loves great classical music, great um, organ music, uh, classical organ music, um, like pipe organs, just really grand yeah. you know, orchestral music yeah. as well and and choirs. And so I, it was like a, a real c- strange combination of things. You know, I, I would always listen to the pieces I was working on when I was growing up playing because I grew up studying Suzuki piano. Oh yeah, and, I've been and, there. Yeah. Been there, done that. <laughs> right. And so a big tenet of that is uh, to listen to the piece before you you start playing it, so it's already in your ears, in your brain. You remember the one, this one, Mississippi Hot Dog, yeah. <laughs> Mississippi Hot Dog, Mississippi Hot Dog. Yeah, man, and so yeah. Except, so, so. except for me, it was it went with it had an accompanying squeak because it was a violin bow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Never enough rosin. <laughs> um, not enough rosin in the world for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. So I, I think it was just, I grew up listening to music. And so that's that's home-based. That's my first love is is just listening to it and appreciating the process of listening. Well, it's interesting to hear you talk about Motown and like the big um, Ray you Charles know, pipe was actually my biggest like influence. Yeah, because was. I mean, you've got groove as an essential element of your record, especially Doorways that yeah. we did, you know. Um there's there's sort of like a real nod to uh um you know just so many different groovy jazz musicians um but but then also you know on songs of a generation or s- songs for a generation yeah. right so so on that one you know there's you've got uh, um even more of the orchestral stuff going on right as well you know the big space and the big um Expressions. Totally. Yeah. I think it was, uh, I can never really run away from my roots. Not that I'd really want to. I'm always trying to explore what what is the most interesting th- thing to me at whatever given moment. I, I kind of think of records as just sort of data points, uh, historical landmarks across my lifetime, I guess. And um, so, yeah, that's true for both of the first two records. But yeah, there are elements of the classical roots, my my love of orchestral music, the influence of my my parents, um, musical taste as well, and um, so I, I, even on Doorways, which was definitely more groove oriented intentionally, there are still strings on that 
and uh, it was fun to do. Yeah, and, and blending different worlds of kind of classical music with the the blues, hip hop. You know, I try to I try to imagine and create music that I would love listening to. Like that's that's the biggest priority when I'm creating a record. Is that am I going to create something that I can go back to and just really enjoy? And I mean, we can unpack that, but that's that's just like the general philosophy when I'm making a record. It's just to create something that I would love listening to because I love listening to music more than I love playing it. Um, Where do you find that there are opportunities to get tripped up on that path? I mean, like, uh, you, you know, a, a reasonable question is, how is it possible for, for us to not make music that we love or want to listen to later? Mm. Oh, you could totally overthink it and... I think I tend to be uh, extremely detail-oriented when it comes to my own music. And so there's the element of trying to make it too perfect or trying to um, control every aspect of it. It's a really slippery slope when you get into more improvised music. And and I wouldn't necessarily call Doorways... uh, a traditional jazz album or anything, but right. it, it has jazz influences. I mean, fusion comes to mind. Yeah, that word. definitely, definitely. Yeah, fusing a lot of different influences together, and, and but there's a big improvisational element to it as well. And so it was a struggle in the moment. Um, you know, this album was really influenced by a lot of time working with Kev Mo in his studio, seeing how he goes through his process. And it's definitely anyone who's ever worked with him or even been tangential to the process of working with him. I'm sure has firsthand stories or secondhand accounts of how much of a stickler for detail he is. And he'll go up and chop up every single thing, make it look like the sessions will look like a barcode, you know? And is he like a hands on yes. Pro Tools kind of? Yeah. Yeah. He, he knows, he knows his way around Pro Tools and he knows what he wants to. Um, and so being around that for two plus years and then sort of embarking on, this doorways process was very informative in that regard. Um, and I kind of wanted to see what would, how would my music sound if I put the amount of time and detail, detailed attention that he does with his music, just as an example. Um, because you can't argue with his result. Now it's a different kind of music completely. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you introduce us to who Kebmo is? Yeah, totally. So he is, this, uh, I guess now he's five-time Grammy-winning award blues musician, Americana musician. He plays guitar. He's primarily a, a singer, songwriter, but he plays guitar, harmonica, banjo, all sorts of... Is he based string. right in Nashville as well? Yeah, yeah. He lives down in Franklin. And um, I've been touring with him since 2017 when we started off with uh, Taj Mahal and Kebmo doing uh, what we would call the Taj Mo tour. And Taj Mo tour. Taj Mo, yeah, that's sort of... <laughs> Uh, talk about fusion. <laughs> so, wait, so just just for some context, how old were you when you got a call to go on a tour like that? Let's see, I would have been 22 years old. That's a pretty good gig. Yeah, it's 22, crazy. You know? it's, it's, it's definitely crazy and unpredictable. Uh, it's still, I'm still kind of pinching myself from What's time What's unpredictable time. about it? Well, the fact that it wasn't even on my radar. Um, right, you didn't even know who Keb Mo was and Taj Mahal necessarily yet? I, I knew peripherally about them, um, but what I mean more is like I didn't know touring was a possibility. Of course, you know, you hear about musicians on tour, but I was kind of in this um, incubation center of academia. Yeah. I went to school at Vanderbilt University after uh, graduating high school in California, moved across the country to Nashville, where I went to study classical piano at the Blair School of Music right here in Nashville. And um, you know, certainly explored jazz and started taking jazz lessons, got more involved in the, the greater Nashville music scene. But after three and a half years, you know, approaching my final semester of, of undergrad, my thought was, well, maybe I'll go and do a master's degree up at the New England Conservatory of Music up in Boston. Right. And, and I applied and auditioned and got a great scholarship offer to go and study with amazing pianists like Jason Moran, who is in one of the most cutting edge pianists in that improvisational music scene today. Um, and then sometime in January, maybe it was February or March, actually, I got a, a call from Keb asking if I would do this gig only because the planned keyboard player had a sudden um, emergency that he had to tend to. Yeah, that kind of answers the question. The next question, 
Um, where do opportunities to get gigs and, and you know, work in studios come from? Yeah. <laughs> I wish the same story, right? I really wish it were more simple or more predictable than than that. But for from my experience, it's it's been a lot of being in the right place, being prepared at the right time. Yeah. Um, sort of where the opportunity meets the preparation, as they say. Yeah. So um the opportunity meets the preparation. Yeah. I feel like there's yeah. some joke I'm supposed to tell in there, but I can't think of one. <laughs> <laughs> we can circle back. You want the critical details from your microphone to get through to your recording, and the Spectra 1964 101 amplifier provides just that. With unequaled headroom, low noise, and a linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks. Used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, and John Lennon, Spectra 1964 brings that same incredible sound to your studio with the new STX 600 mic pre with built-in comp limiter. Start making classic records again at spectra1964.com. Are you sick of microphones that make your music sound harsh and brittle? The new Amethyst mic by Jay-Z Microphones brings you a rich, warm tone with perfect detail using the Golden Capsule technology. Resulting from 30 years of microphone design, the Amethyst is hand-built using carefully selected parts with Class A discrete circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and an advanced shock mount to make sure you're recording sound awesome. This is my voice on the Amethyst right now. Use the limited-time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Amethyst Mike at jzmike.com. Awesome, man. Well, so, you know, one of the things I like to ask guests on the, the podcast, uh, and, and forgive me if I'm sort of blindsiding you with That's this fine. question, but I like to ask our guests to share an inspirational quote, you know, either mm. for hitting the studio or for music. Um, if there's anything that comes to mind for you, share it. Or if there's just anybody that has really inspired you in music and creativity and maybe, you know, specifically in improvisation. Yeah, I you think know, um, mine? one of the highlights of studying at uh, Vanderbilt during the time that I did um, from 2013 to 2017 was that I overlapped with the beginning of Jeff Coffin's tenure at, um, or I don't know if he has tenure, but his, his time at Vanderbilt, he's still there. Um, but he's this amazing saxophone, yeah, Jeff's woodwind, awesome. improvisational, creative master who, you know, cut his teeth with Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones, won three Grammys there, now plays with Dave Matthews Band and has his own artist thing going as well in town. Now, from and, an old guy's perspective, I'm going to say he cut his teeth long before that. Oh, I'm I, sure. I, I, I've known Jeff for, for many years. In fact, he played on the record that I produced for Roscoe Gordon. I brought oh, cool. him in to play saxophone. Okay. And it was just amazing yeah you know? and I yeah, remember thank run, you for that. running yeah. into him um randomly in Nashville just I was actually at an outdoor event and I just heard this the sort of wafting tones of saxophone coming from around the corner in my ear as a Boston native who loved jazz music yeah. my ears like perked up and I was like whoa that's the real deal where's that coming from you know yeah, and I he, walked up and introduced myself to him yeah he kind of has an unmistakable sound once you get to know him and he started teaching at Vanderbilt, I think, in 2015, and so halfway through my time there. And I started studying with him and and being mentored by him. And one of the things that he told me, I remember there's this, I'll tell this quick story. There's um there was a master class, um, maybe my junior year, where this um, um Wycliffe Gordon, a great trombone player. Um, educator and composer, Wycliffe Gordon came to Vanderbilt to give a master class. And part of the master class was getting a chance to play with him. So he he got up there and played trombone, and three of us or four of us in the rhythm section played behind him. And he called a tune, and and we played, and it, it was fine. But I, I had a lesson right after that with Jeff, and I sort of walked in, and I told him, you know, man, something didn't feel quite right. And he's like, uh-huh. Because Jeff, Jeff always kind of knew. He was always a couple steps ahead of me when, when it came to um, sort of our teacher-student relationship. And um, he's like, uh-huh. So he, he kind of already knew what I was about to say, but he let me say it anyway. And I was like, I didn't really feel like I was playing authentically to myself. I kind of felt like I was trying to be somebody else or trying to fit. Like I was thinking I should be playing 
how Wycliffe Gordon would expect a piano player to play behind Wycliffe Gordon. <laughs> you know, I, I, I have a tendency to get in my head sometimes, certainly when I was a student more so. And, and Jeff was like, mm-hmm. And then I'll never forget what he said. He said, you need to remember that you don't need permission. I was like, wow. And that kind of like, in my mind, it kind of like blew these imaginary walls off like my creative identity, I guess. I don't know. But he said that and all of a sudden it was like my mind had been opened up. I was like, oh yeah, you're right. I don't need permission, uh, certainly in that context, to play what I hear. And, and I don't really, I don't need to feel like I need to fight myself. If I really authentically hear it, lean into that and respond in that authentic way. Um, and I think as students who are, are struggling to find their, their voice, you know, we hear that phrase a lot. There is a tendency to be like, is this the right way for me to be playing right now? And, and yes, there are right and wrong, big general things. But when it comes to creating and creatively reacting to someone else, in the moment, it's not really productive to be second guessing yourself to that to that level. Not to mention the fact that the just the very act of second guessing means you just missed the moment. Exactly, you know? you're out of it. Your brain's already out of it. Yeah, exactly. It's it's, it's, it's that classic. That it's the game. It's like as soon as you think of the game, you've lost the game. Right. It's it's one of those things I've noticed about the moment in music. It's like improvisation or just when all of a sudden you're in the groove. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's, 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 um, you know, we're allowed to swear on this, this podcast. It's such a fuck you where it's like, um, the moment where you appreciate how good everything's going, it's gone. Yeah. In music and in performance, like yeah. in, that, in that magical take or whatever, too. I think it's one of the reasons why I like trying to keep performances on the edge all the time in the right. studio. Yeah. I was thinking about that. That's a great point you bring up because there are a couple moments on, the most recent record, The Doorways, for me, that I remember in the moment being like, wow, that was incredible. And I think listening back, every single time it still gets me. And those are the moments that I know are, those are the things I live for. And yeah. it feels like an amazing just coincidence that we just happened to be there in the right time and we were in the red and we, we got it. And those are the types of things, circling back to your question about what sort of challenges there are for me in the studio no matter how perfect you get something, you can't you can't create those moments after the fact. Right. Like you can't layer synths and pads and all sorts of stuff afterwards. You know, you can't even if you're slicing things up and moving things around, nothing can replace the in the moment moments that you capture. And there are a few of those on doorways that I'm that still get me at any time I'll come back to the record and listen to the track Negative Truth, which um, just to be completely transparent, that was the only track on the entire record that was untouched in terms of um, editing after the fact. Everything oh, else, really? yeah, everything else, I, I went in and whether it was lining something up or or mixing and matching piano solos or or road solos with you know the rest of the band. Um, everything on that track, um, for the most part, was. I mean, the bulk of the track, the meat of the track was just everyone was playing with everyone else, hearing everything that you that the listener is hearing in the moment. And that's that's the spirit of jazz for me. Yeah. It's a communication between yeah. different players. Totally. You know? In fact, I, I feel like at some point I wanted to figure out what my definition of music was. Mm. And I just decided it's communication between human beings. Wow. I mean you know, and then you ask tough, tough questions like, yeah, but what about programmed music? And then it's mm -hmm. like, well, you still got to like, you know, if you, if it's, if it's programmed music that you like, somehow it's the communication is coming through that to you to evoke an emotional response, right. you know? Yeah. Not to mention it, it's in a way indirect communication between the the human who created the technology for you to be able to have that programmed music and yeah. the, the human interacting with the technology. Yeah. And then we were just before this, I was playing you a clip. I was like, Hey, have you seen this guy that Mark oh, Rebier, yeah. you know, who's like blowing up on YouTube and everything. And, and he does these in the moment live looping things. Um, and you know, he, he'll do improv in front of people and everything. And, and again, it's like that same thing of like, you know, you can also, you can use all the technology, but you can also, 
put it together in the moment. Right. And then, and then the communication is between you and the audience, you know, whatever. Right. But I, I do think in the studio, you know, one of the challenges has always been in the overdub world, it becomes a communication sometimes between you and a computer that's not listening to you, you know? And so mm. that I feel like can be really challenging. Have you run into that? Do you have any thoughts about like, you know, the challenges of overdubs and, and um, yeah, where you feel like overdubs somehow fall, sh- fall short, you know, in your heart? Totally. I think it's, again, it's like having an unrealistic way to time travel for me is, and, and you can fake it pretty good, um, but it feels like, Again, you're kind of out of the moment. Like for me, as you know, since we've we've done quite a bit of recording together, I will be a pain in the ass about doing another take of a solo, doing another take of a solo. And after 10 takes, I might still not have it. And not to mention, you know, that's completely for after a couple takes, you know, I'm, I'm gone. But I'm gonna I'm right. gonna be stubborn enough and, and want to do another one anyway. But the bigger thing is like I'm not really in the moment anymore. What was what was happening musically around me. I'm still interacting with it, but when I know what's coming, it changes how I, um, how I create and how I react. I'm no longer really reacting in the moment. I'm right, Now you're planning. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, uh, and there's benefit to that too. I think with um, more like pop music or like with, with Keb's stuff, it makes sense to plan a little bit more. And I think he, he's told me stories about being in the studio in his early days, like 94 was when he released his first record, um, and, which is crazy because that was the year I was born. <laughs> and um, he talks, you know, we'll, we'll go back, you know, because we're, we're, touring, we're touring quite a bit each year. And one of his famous kind of refrains when he's talking to the band is, don't listen to the record, the record's wrong. Um, with, hey, say, say it again. Don't listen to the record, the record is wrong. In I'll terms of record, in terms of like trying to learn the, the song, you can't you can't learn the song correctly from the record a lot of the time. Now there's there's some some songs where uh, he thinks he got it right, and but the majority of them he'll tell us, "Let's we got to figure it out right here and right now." Right, right. And really, and you know, part of that is just a difference in live performance versus the studio. Yeah. Yep. But part of that also is sort of going back to what I was saying is that I think he's learned over his years, kind of how I have um, just a little bit, is um, what role does overdubbing have in your creative process? And how much do you honor what was captured in the moment versus how much do you go back and say, well, that's not quite right. And where do you draw the line? Well, it's when it's detracting from the vocal or from the, the narrative, well, you probably should change it. Um, yeah, detracting. Detracting is a good word. If it's detracting from what you would recognize as good, then yeah, it's it's detracting. You know, end of story, right? Yeah, yeah. But that's a judgment call, and it, there's no one right answer necessarily. And yeah, and it's a huge gray area. I feel like I remember hearing a story about Dizzy Gillespie saying that, like, um there's no such thing as a wrong note or something like whatever note he lands on at, at very worst, he's only a half step away from the, from yeah the, the right, the better note or something like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think Miles Davis had s- something similar and, you know, Roy Hargrove, the late Roy Hargrove had just passed. Um, he's a great trumpet player as well. Was notorious for being stubbornly attached to whatever it was captured in the moment. Yeah. Um, which is amazing because he's recorded some incredible albums as a leader. Um, I just remembered to give a shout out and a thank you to the person who inter- introduced us to each other. Do you remember who that was? Was that Jen Gunderman? It was Jen Gunderman. Oh, yeah. yeah. Was, speaking of professors at Vanderbilt University. Yeah, that's that's wild. Um, and Jen, of course, has gone on to do all kinds of great things. And, and she and her with Cheryl husband, Crow. Uh, yeah, oddly freed, both touring with Cheryl Crow now in their band, in, yeah. in her band. Yes. Um, Jen and I are doing a, a panel at Vanderbilt sometime in March, I think. Um, well, that'll be, that'll talk about time travel. This will be out after that. So oh, great, <laughs> great. 
If you're ready to upgrade your studio to the famous sound of APIs, large format consoles, then you're ready for The Box, a small format console featuring the same analog circuitry and original 2520 op amp design that has made API famous for 50 years. Record through eight world-class mic pre-channels, mix through 24 smooth-as-glass faders, and blend mics, analog effects, and parallel compression at the speed of electrons rather than the speed of your computer latency. Upgrade your home studio to legendary status with The Box from apiaudio.com. All right, cool, man. So um, let's talk a little bit about your studio. So you talked cool. about, you know, editing things and making those decisions. Um, what What is your studio setup when you go home to do to work in your studio and edit things? And what sort of process allows you to do some recording in the studio and then take it home? Mm. You know, what things have you learned about that that work well for that process? And what things are you like, man, this is such a pain in the ass when I try and do that, you know? Yeah, it's a combination of being really uh, precise and intentional and then also kind of uh, being more intuitive. And there's there's two separate categories. Like one for me is like the the stuff that I'll do when I wake up, have a couple cups, a uh, couple cups of coffee. There you go. You hadn't had one, right? No, no, yeah. I just gave you an espresso, so maybe right. it doesn't help. <laughs> Try that again. Um, you know, I'll wake up in the morning and have a couple cups of coffee and just get to work and and doing like three hours, two to three hours of really intense editing um, where I'll listen Interesting. from so the, multiple sound your, sources. Your first move of the day would be the, the um, I mean, I almost, I want to call editing the mundane, like the, yeah. the you know, doing the, the tough um, clerical yeah. work. Of I love that kind of work actually, because usually like, usually I will be able to arrive at a suitable answer for me. It, it's it's kind of like a, a math problem. Like you'll arrive at an answer that's correct. Um, not always, but but for things like, even regardless whether it's on the grid or not, does it feel good? And usually I am focused, the most focused in the morning, the first three hours of the morning or so. And so I like doing it, assuming I have something to work on. It's already been recorded, but it's just kind of raw. I'll go go in and just edit and then I'll leave it there, go about my day. And then the creative stuff I love doing late at night um, when things feel really peaceful, when no one's texting me, I'm not getting any emails, um, you know, no one's around. It's just me in my studio. It's, you know, I just have a, a Mac um, and a bunch of keyboards. But, you know, when I'm editing, I'm just, just staring at a computer screen. But I, I like listening from a lot of different sound sources. So I have my uh, various different speakers. I, I listen on my phone. You hit me to the Airfoil app, which is great. Oh, yeah, yeah, which will stream the audio over to your phone. And there's yeah. a few options for that these days, too. Yeah. But just the, just the act of being able to send something to your phone and listen to that way is interesting. Right. And I also like listening on, on in-ears um, sometimes. And I know there's different schools of thought on on those, but I like to listen from every single possible sound source that I personally would ever find myself listening to, even if it were just five minutes here or there on an airplane or something. It's a little like the advice that Jeff gave you um, and the engineering side, which is like, because there is a part of us as engineers that goes, well, what's the right way to listen to this? Yeah. As opposed to the part, which you just said, which is like, how would I listen to it? You mm -hmm. know, like trust yourself and trust your own experience. And, and, and after, after working together on my first record, I remember that we would spend a lot of time driving around in your in your Volvo just around around here in Nashville, listening. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but but we we just crank it and we'd drive around and, and grab a smoothie and then you know come back and just sit in the driveway and listen some more. And between here in the studio and you know in the car, um, in ears, you know Bose headphones, which are way too muddy in the bass, you know Google speakers, you know whatever I can. Whatever I might ever listen to anything on, yeah. I like to listen to. And if anything strikes me, like another thing I like to do is, you know, once I think I've got it, which I never do, but I'll, I'll just put it on and then I'll just start washing dishes or, or doing laundry or doing something. And that kind of tunes me out enough where I'm not OCD 
kind of clamping down on every single second of music. But things will start kind of rising to the surface. And, and then I'll hear something. I'll just start writing it down. And then by the end of the track, five minutes, you know, I'll just have a whole note app. And I love using that note app on my phone and voice memos too um, to take detailed notes. And then I'll just have a bunch of stuff and I'll go, go in there and revisit it again. Um, and then just doing that a few times, it's like over time, you're just kind of sanding it down. And of course, there's a, the danger of sanding it down too much where it becomes kind of sterile sounding. Right, right. Um, you don't want to remove all the, all the rough edges. Definitely not. But, you know, but, but that's where, you know, save as, save as, save as. Yeah, you leave yourself a breadcrumb, right. breadcrumb trail. Exactly. It's like, um, it's like walking around town and trying to like catch your reflection in every mirror that goes by. It's like, hey, how's, how's my haircut look now? You know? <laughs> uh, but it reminds me of a quote that I think I read recently from Rick Rubin where he said, um, it, it's important to pay attention when you're not paying attention. Exactly. You yeah. Know? And putting, intentionally putting yourself in situations where your attention is compromised, but you're still paying attention. And I think it was my brother, Nate, who told me a story of Rudy Van Gelder. I think it was Rudy, that he was, uh, his way of producing jazz albums in the studio is he would read the newspaper while the band was performing. Mm. And then if something caught his attention, he'd look up from the paper. Yeah. Of course, I thought that story was about like, if something caught his attention in a good way, he'd be like, hey, that was pretty good. It's probably more like if something caught his attention in a bad way, it was a sign that it, right. it disrupted, you know? Uh-huh. It detracted. Don't be a detractor. <laughs> yeah. That's the name of this episode. Um, okay, cool. Very cool stuff, man. Um, so so your home studio is set up. You've got Pro Tools, uh, you know, a computer to record with, um, and instruments. What, what sort of instruments do you like to work with? Yeah, I, mean, I, I love a combination guys. of... Um, I think you have a real piano. You've got a, probably a... What, do you have a Rhodes or a, or a, a Whirly? I've got a B3. A B3, B3 okay. with a Leslie um, speaker. Uh, and I, I've got my Chord Kronos, which I love. That's what I usually tour with. Okay. Is a full 88 weighted keyboard Chord Kronos, which has a lot of amazing um, sounds built into the board. Is that, uh, were there a lot of sounds on the Doorways record that we did that came out of the Chord? Yeah, it was a combination of those. There is some, some from the Moog Sub 37 um, analog synth that I have as well. Um, combination of real B3 and then digital B3 from, I have a, a Nord Electro 4D, which has the real draw bars. Um, and I love running that through the Neo Ventilator 2 Leslie pedal. Okay. Um, which to me, when you dial it in, th- there's <clears throat> four different knobs on it that control, you know, overdrive and, and the acceleration of the, of the Leslie from slow to fast and, and things like that and the depth of it all. But when you com- you get the right combination of the right Nord organ sound plus that, certainly for the studio when you're wiping out so much of the low end anyway, it sounds just as good, right, in, as in my opinion, organ. as a real B3. Have yeah. they taken it to the next step and just called it the Norgan? Because they really, <laughs> that's what I would have done. I think we can write them a proposal after this, uh, after this podcast and um, petition them. Let me ask you this question. Yeah. In the world of digital keyboard sounds, yeah. I, not being a keyboardist myself, but appreciating those, sometimes I go to look and I'm like, w- like where do I even begin? There's like an, it, it never, it literally never ends. The possibilities, yeah. the sounds, and everything like that. How do you navigate that? What what do you what allows you to to like find a sound and then put that together with a part and then add that to a record and have it be the right thing to do? Yeah, I think it takes a lot of experimenting. Um, and also, it depends on your intention for the for what you're trying to create. Um, I remember I was at a, a master class last year um, with a guy named Rick Beato, who's this oh, yeah, uh, amazing, right, right amazing on, YouTuber. Yeah. He's got over a million subscribers now on YouTube. But he was giving a master class at Vanderbilt, and I just went because I, I know Rick and and wanted to just see what he would have to say. And one of the things that he told the uh, the students who were performing was that it was a criticism that he had, and he said your music should sound like it belongs in, at the time it was 2019, but it should sound like it belongs in the year that you're creating it. Nothing against you know, retro albums or, or um, tribute concerts or tribute albums or tribute bands. I mean, I think that's all great. But if your intention, and I think it was the intention of the band, if you're trying to create something that, that you want to sound relevant, really see that through and think through sounds, think through 
um, harmonic choices, melodic choices. But I think sounds is a big, a big aspect to that. So for yeah. me on doorways, I was trying to think about sounds that if I were listening, I try to remove myself from the equation, which is of course impossible. But trying to imagine if I were listening to this, and I've never heard this before. Does this sound like a 2019 or 2020 kind of sound? And so that was a that's a real big criteria. Again, there's no real yeah. right or wrong yeah, answer. There, there can't be a right answer because there can't. It's when you say like a 2020 sound, it's not like a 2020 sound is out, already exists and it's out there. It's your now in 2020, and if you just trust yourself, that is the 2020 sound, right? Yeah, and it's like the fine line between uh, even listening to myself say that I'm like it sounds that sounds cool, but also. That sounds stupid. <laughs> like, what is a 2020 sound? Oh, I'm so glad you just said that. Sorry. Right now, I don't know if you're a Spinal Tap fan, but, uh, yeah. but I'll quote some Spinal Tap. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a fine line between clever and stupid. <laughs> right. Yeah, ex- and that's exactly what I think about 20. Like, what does it mean to sound? But that is something that I do think about. And, um, you know, some other things that I love in terms of sounds are uh, Spectrosonics. There's this amazing company who makes um, virtual sounds and virtual instruments. They've put out four, specifically four great products. And one of those is Omnisphere, which has been around forever. So it's funny because there's a, there's a connection there. So Spectra 1964, is, who's also been a sponsor on this podcast, is, um, you know, they, uh, Bill Cheney makes these incredible outboard gear, mic pre's, things like that, um, the, the C610 compressor. And they used to be called Spectrosonics, but then, then Spectrosonics, the plug-in company, came along years ago and then adopted that and then they couldn't get back. Anyway, yeah. this is a, is a connection. So Rockstars, in case it's confusing, there's two Spectras out there. There's Spectrasonics, right. the plugins company, which makes great keyboard sounds. Great so, keyboard sounds, so great continue, synth sounds. And I, I love just, and their their user interfaces um, are so intuitive too on, on, the, on the computer, just scrolling through sounds and finding, there's a lot of possibilities, which is both intimidating but also a, a pro for sure. Um, but I, I love, I think Keyscape is fantastic. I think the Rhodes, the Whirlies, the Tac pianos, even some of the real piano sounds are the best out there, as far as I can tell. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell people that and they'll always be like, yeah, but have you tried this one? Have you tried that one? I'll, I'll try them and I'll hear them, but I always come back to, to Keyscape and um, the, the Spectrasonics. They also have Trillion, which is a great bass. Right. Plugin, which I use some of that on doorways as well, and then what, what do you have to say about the difference between the real instrument and the digital one in your experience as a as a player? How often are you like, yeah, this the the digital thing can't possibly give me what the real one does, or how you know when you're yeah. like, no, it works it works great for this case. I think I'm all of them all equally as tools, and I think it all depends on the context, and there's no one is better than the other objectively, maybe in a specific moment, one is better than the other only because it's more appropriate for the musical moment. It's only serving the song more appropriate, pro- appropriately or more completely. Um, and that's something I've, I've learned from Keb. You know, growing up as a classical pianist, my control of the sound is right here in my fingers or in the pedal, in my right foot or my left foot. It has nothing to do, like if I sit down on an instrument, I can't, there's never going to be enough time if you know I'm just sitting there warming up for a show. I can't have a piano guy come in and re, retu- retune the piano or recalibrate the piano or or whatever. So I'm I have to learn how to deal with the sound that I have. And so that mentality carried me through beginning touring with Keb. And so I always thought of the sound as oh this is the sound that I'm presented with. I just have to figure out how to make it work. I have to sort of mold myself around the sound. Yeah. He taught me. No, find the right sound, and it will sort of mold your, mold it around you. What you have to say, and uh, sort of the idea that the right sound will always yield the right part, or the whatever you're supposed to play will come right, right. as a result of inspiration from the sound. And so, yeah, in terms of the real, real thing or the the fake thing, I think it's all they're all equal tools. And um, I have, you know, I prefer to play a real piano most of the time. But I'm not going to say that a real piano will always be better than the Keyscape piano. Um, well, that kind of circles back to my question before when you're talking about like find the sound and it will inform you on the part. Mm-hmm. And that's why sometimes it's felt like a challenge, like looking around for sounds. Cause like you, you hear a keyboard sound like, ooh, this would be so cool if I did this. And, yeah. and it kind of causes me to, you know, it's a pad. And so yeah. you play pad 
chords or whatever, or it's like, you know, a, a bell tone or a bouncy rhythmic thing. And you play something that fits that. And I guess that's just where it goes. You know, you just, you, you yeah. find that sound, it informs you on the part, you try it. And then you're like, that part sucked. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think it's experimenting and coming back to, and, and, and does it still hit you in the same way when you come back to it? Or does yeah. it kind of sound annoying? Um, and I think another thing that I've noticed about myself, and actually, um, I'm giving away big trade secrets here, <laughs> um, or, or experiences. Um, something that Keb told me is that that I've, I've realized is true is when people get uncomfortable musically, usually what they'll do is they'll, they will play more, and they will yeah. they will start filling up space, and. Um, and that's true of people talking too. Sometimes when people feel uncomfortable, they, they'll just talk more. And I think those two are related, but that's not exactly the point right now. It's more, more so like if you are, if the sound causes you to just play, 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 that could be cool because you're inspired by the sound, but you should also be inspired to listen. And you're not going to really be able to listen completely if you're just playing, playing, playing. So in, in it, um, indicative of the right sound is also a tendency to leave some space um, as well, and that's that's something that I've realized, and could be helpful maybe for some people when they're looking for the right sound. Is and this is not always true, but for me, it has been true a lot of the time. Is you know, this is a cool sound. You know, I'm playing with it, playing with it. I'll leave some space, play, play, leave some space, and I'm leaving space because the musical ideas that I'm that I'm playing are inspired by the sound, and I want to listen to them, and I want to react to them. I don't just want to like fill up space. I don't know if that makes right, sense. Right, yeah. But that's that's something that that has been helpful because a lot of times like otherwise what are indications of the right sound? Right, exactly. You yeah. Know? No, no, I think that's great and um you know, I'm thinking about all these other connections. So I've been doing a lot more writing. Um you know, I've had to write a lot around this whole effort to save home studios. Yeah. I've um I've been doing some songwriting and I'm like trying to fit in all the words like that would make sense as a sentence for the lyrics of something and uh, and then also in the studio, I I can hear a lot of the interactions between the musical parts coming mm. together. And in all those cases, it, it's always been better when I go back in and I just delete, 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 mm. delete, delete. And in fact, when I'm doing some of this this writing work, um, just text writing, and I've had help um, from some some of the legal team that I've been working with. And he goes in, he's like, I put some things in brackets that you might want to consider working on. I'm like, I'm just like, dude, I'm so grateful that now, now I just go in and everything that he bracketed, I just delete it all immediately. I don't even look at it again. Yeah. You know? And it just makes it all better. It's like, yeah. You know, the more editing is such a powerful tool. Creating space. But in creating, creating space, space is you know? so important. I think that's that's one thing that is universally a true universally true about all of my favorite music is listening to the space within the music and around the music. And that's that's not just some like esoteric BS that I'm spewing. I think it really it allows the the music to exist at a higher level when when there is space and when you're not just overwhelmed by information. Because we get, music is information. And you know, just if we're analyzing it, it's information for your ears and your brain and, and we're so when there's space for it for the listener to interact with it, especially improvisational music. I think that's that's so important. Um, I think even instrumental music is about a narrative a lot of the time. Certainly my own music, I'll speak to my own music. I think there's always a narrative there. And so you got to leave room for the listener in that narrative. I love that. Um, I've never actually thought about it that way. The idea that, you know, it's it's one thing to begin to understand that you leave space for space to hear the other music in there or mm -hmm. the other sound or the silence. Yeah. But I've never thought of leaving space for the listener to exist. Yeah. In exactly. the music. That's pretty wild, man. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's take that as our cue to take a quick break. Sure. And we'll come back in for the jam session. Sounds great. Amazing stuff. Rockstars, of course, I've got uh, links to stuff we're talking about in the show notes. Please go check out David's records. Um, and then I've put together a video playlist so you can just go listen through right now and check out these records that I've been very, very, very honored to make with you, dude. Thanks, and, man. And we'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. 
You know what it feels like when inspiration hits and you want to capture your great song idea, but then the studio gets in the way and it's just no fun anymore. Wouldn't it feel awesome if you could simplify the process of producing your music from inspiration to final masterpiece? PreSona Studio One is a powerful digital audio workstation that helps you compose your music with a complete collection of virtual instruments for keyboards and drums, MIDI tools for hip hop, EDM, and film, a flexible sketch pad with chord charts and key recognition for songwriting and arranging, and classic effects pedals and amp simulators for guitar and bass. With 37 high quality effects plugins, integrated Melodyne, and drag and drop flexibility, you can easily edit and polish your mixes. And Studio One is the only DAW with a built-in mastering studio so that you can take your record from writing to radio ready all in one place. Download your free version of Studio One Prime and get started now at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you. If you're using a Mac in your recording studio and you're tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly, then Otherworld Computing is the solution for you. OWC can help keep your existing Mac and studio current and relevant so that you can make great music. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac, you can get the most mileage out of your studio with OWC. Offering a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49, there's no need to get frustrated when you can achieve the speed to create and the capacity to dream at OWC.com. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is David Rogers joining us here at the studio. And dude, are you ready to jam? Let's jam, man. That you know the definition of jamming. <laughs> I think Actually, I do. <laughs> what is jamming? Is there a difference between jamming and in and, and improvising in your world? Does the word think, does the term jam get used much in in the in your world? Jazz jams, but maybe jazz the, jams. That's just because yeah, of the alliteration. The j- jam sessions. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Right. The alliteration. I don't know. I I think they get used an equal amount. I. I prefer, I think jam has a more like community element to it. Yeah, like than, a drum circle. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's a little more of a part of me. There we go, yeah. Um, all right, so we were talking about the importance of leaving space and and probably more importantly, listening for the space, you know, like discovering it. And I love that idea that, that you know, some of that space is actually so you can he- hear the listener. Like what a cool concept. All of a sudden, you become a contributor to an album if you're if you're a listener. Yeah. Um, but talk about what that means to you when you're actually out there. You're actually playing with other musicians, and you've got headphones on. I'm going to assume that mm. you know most s- sessions involve headphones. So talk talk a little bit about how you successfully you know hear the spaces and and what it means to listen to the other musicians versus listening to yourself. I yeah. Guess. I think it's um, related to rhythm most of the time. And I did a session last week um, for a friend and there were multiple passes of different guitar parts and then also multiple passes of different key parts. Um, and she's a vocalist and of course there's bass and drums and percussion. So there's a lot of a lot potentially going on. And so there, there can be a danger to overplay when you, you're first starting off and you're like... Yeah, they're we're gonna add more stuff, but you're you're not hearing that those extra parts yet. And so part of that for me is just using my imagination, making something as simple but as complete in the moment, like really owning this whirly part. I was playing the whirly last week and, and B3. And it felt very simple, but I, I also like to think about it like if everything were stripped down and it was just the vocalist and one of us, could the song still stand? And that's a mark of a great part for me. And so I try to run everything through that kind of mindset as well. And, and leaving space for the, the lyric, I think, is an important part. Um, or, or the melody, if it's instrumental music. Uh, Cab always says, don't step on the money. Don't step on the <laughs> don't money. Don't step on the I money. It, <laughs> and um, of course, he's the money. So, or wh- whoever, whoever the artist is, they're the money. Um, both literally and figuratively, and and so I think that 
that's definitely a good incentive to leave space. <laughs> um, but I think it's just listening in the moment, but also listening ahead, imagining, leaving spaces for your imagination too. Yeah, um, you bring up so many good points. I mean, we've talked about that on the podcast. I'm trying to remember, uh, I'll have to circle back and remember who, who specifically brought it up. But it was the idea of taking the parts that are there and then going, does this really, do all these does all this belong to one instrument, mm-hmm. you know, or is it really, can we divide this up amongst some different things yeah. um, and, and work it that way? Yeah. Uh, actually, I think it was the, the uh, um, outfielders or something like that. But um, anyway, the, that concept comes up to me in the studio too, because as, when I'm thinking about production, you know, it's like I hear it on, I, I will find myself often trying to play you know, a bunch of stuff into one guitar part. And then it's like, then it's a good question. It's like, should that be all happening on the one guitar part where it's difficult to put this thing and that thing together? Yeah. And like in that eighth note moment between one note and then then the next fingering happening. Yeah. Somehow it's a little bit sloppy right there. Or is it two parts? And, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Because I think there's a big element of like orchestrating in the studio where you, you have to be, and it goes back to listening. You know, if it's me and, and three other musicians, if I'm doing my job, whether as the sideman or the artist, I'm fully aware of what everyone is playing first before I, I decide how I fit in. And if I decide that I need to fit in a way that's going to sort of step on someone else, it's a good idea to talk to them or communicate somehow with them to maybe you know leave a little bit more room for me if it's appropriate. Right. But um, yeah, it's a great question of, of like, how do you make those decisions of... Subdivisions. Yeah, in high school mall, or sorry, <laughs> my bad rush quote. Um, so, so that's where I find it a lot of times. Like, you have a part that that has that voices accents, important accents, and highlights in the rhythm rhythm of something that's happening. But then, if you're playing it by yourself, you're also throwing in the subdivisions in between those. Mm-hmm. And then along comes a drummer with a hi hat, and it's like, do we, are we both subdividing, or yeah. should I? Shut up, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think I try to avoid redundant rhythmic redundancy a lot of times, um, unless it is absolutely intentional. Um, certainly, layering things is, is can be cool, but if if so, if you know the hi hat can cover a lot of ground, with, yeah. w- that a rhythm guitar player doesn't need to. Symbols in general can cover a. Lot oh yeah, sonic ground too. Yeah. yeah. Um. They can be a real challenge as a producer sometimes, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say something I forgot. Well, I always, I'm always struck too with symbols about there are these times where I'm like, oh my god, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta act like that story I heard about the big name, big you know, britches producer who walked out there and removed all the symbols off the drummer's <laughs> drum kit, you know, and don't even say a word. And then later I'll come back and I'll be like, you know, for all that worry about the symbols, by the time we were done, it actually sounds great and it worked out just fine. You know? Right. <laughs> There's so many things like that too. There's one thing I was going to say that, um, just like one specific example for, for the people listening that I'm sure people are, are musically savvy and, and aware on the, who listen to this podcast, but something that, that came to my attention was like the power of beat four. Like, you know, so many tunes are in like a 4-4 four, four time signature and a backbeat kind of groove. And a lot of times when you're going into a section, everyone wants to like, you know, and the downbeat is like the powerful moment. Everyone wants to like create more gravity to the downbeat. Um, and people do that in so many different ways. You know, like on an organ, they might like, like gliss, glissando up, down, and just have like a real high note on, on the downbeat, but create a lot of stuff. Something, if everyone's doing it, it becomes way less cool. You know, you don't need everybody. Yeah. To, and, you know, of course, the drummer's going to be doing some sort of cool fill. The bass player's going to be leading in somehow. Maybe the keyboard player is going to be playing like a couple notes leading into the downbeat. Now, if one or two of those people completely lay out on beat four, now I would just recommend that people try this. Just create a little like Logic or Pro Tools demo, use virtual instruments and, and try this. Create a four bar loop and experiment how it, how I, I won't say better or worse, but how differently it feels when everybody's leading into beat beat one from beat four versus let the bass player drop out on beat four. And then that gravity is so much more. Part of the uh, um, responsibility of everyone playing together is not just to individually make 
them sounds th- them some themselves sound great and own their sound, but it's to support everybody else too. And if you're really listening, you're going to do this anyway. But um, like if the drummer is doing a cool fill, lay out Rhodes player, right. you know, <laughs> yeah. let the drummer have his moment. Yeah, you know, you're going to complicate it. Um, and it's going to be it's going to be slightly less cool a lot of the times. Now, of course, there's moments where everyone doing something cool at once is appropriate. That's the nature of the band. The sum of the parts is, or the whole, how does it go? The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. You know, there are, there's a thing that can happen in the, in the pocket of music when a band is performing together, where if you, if you took each one by themselves, you'd be like, oh, this is a little bit, we get this a little late here, a little early there. We got to, we got to change that, you know, but it's the way that it all comes together that Mm -hmm. creates a new, a new center for the rhythm, you know, yeah. of, of the, the groove of a band. Totally. And these are, these at face value, these are very simple ideas and very, very elementary concepts. But it's amazing how many people are just unwilling to do these things. And I think a lot of time, a lot of times it has to do with ego and pride and people just want to, no one's willing to sort of be willing to be unified as a band. Everyone is wants to be that guy. I think the greatest session players have a certain humility about them, and they're willing. They know it's not about them, so they have no problem leaving space. And actually, people who le- who are willing to leave space at the right moments those are those are the cats who are getting called. And um, of course, you can create that. You know, you could just on the grid beat four and take it out or mute it. You know, and I, I do that a lot. Great experiment. I mean, a great or a great exercise to just go try that. Yeah, just just experiment and see how it hits you differently, and and then make your own judgment call. I won't tell anybody it's better or worse. For me, I like it better, but that doesn't mean it's appropriate for for any everybody. So recently, I was experiencing some of the challenges in overdub world mm-hmm. of um the places where you can get tripped up in terms of you you're you're adding something and like oh here's a new idea like. In a in a pop production, maybe like here's a tag after the chorus. Mm-hmm. We can have some sort of lead line before the next verse happens. So here's one that's cool. Mm-hmm. And then you listen and you're like, and, and you're like, hold on, listen a little harder. And underneath your underneath there, you'll discover that there's already a roadmap for what's happening rhythmically, um, harmonically, you know, melodically. And if you do this other thing, even though it's cool on its own. You just, it's the stepping on the money thing. It just, it mm-hmm. just killed that other. Now, now when a listener listens, they just hear a confusion, right? a confusing message right there instead of a, something that's like unifying. Exactly. Yeah. It kind of takes you out of the moment. You're kind of superimposing this cool thing, which of course I'm sure it's still cool, but is it appropriate for the song? Yeah. Probably not. And then, you know, to take it the other direction, you think about um, composers like Mahler, for example, mm. Who would take a, a, a? Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is my, my limited classical <laughs> understanding. Sure, Mahler would take a simple uh, line or phrase and just double the crap out of it. You know, he'd take mm. the orchestra and double it up, wouldn't he? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and it reinforces the line. It's like doubling a vocal. It just yeah. like it's like keep strengthening that thing. Yeah, I I was home uh, in Los Angeles for Christmas and New Year's and got the chance to see um, Mahler's. It was Mahler's second symphony and played by the LA Phil and just blew my mind. I mean, if I could ever create something, just a fraction of how amazing that that symphony is. Yeah, that's, that's a whole nother topic, but you and, brought up Mahler, so I... Yeah, yeah, but yeah. like, uh, I, and I remember I used to love listening to that. I can't remember if it was the third or something. Mm-hmm. I think, I'm thinking Beethoven's third was the other one I really loved yeah. too. Eroica, right? Think so? Maybe. Come on, Mr. Classical. Uh, no, <laughs> but anyway, um, Mahler. I remember hearing that he would also take the horns and like reposition the orchestra to like put put different instruments in different locations. And again, I love that as a as a um, analogy to production in the studio, where it's like think about your sounds, think about you know your arrangement of voices and tones in a production, and like what needs to be forward and what needs to be back. Yeah. Yeah, it's really amazing. Um, first of all, I will say, yes, Eroica is the third symphony, you were right. <laughs> um, but in Mahler's second symphony that I was at, actually there was several moments where there was like full horn sections off stage, but you could hear them from sort of the wings. And totally, 
they were they were ahead of their time, but they're thinking about a space, kind of this programmatic composition. You know what that is in the studio, in the home studio? That's when somebody figures out to put a drum mic in the bathroom. Nice. It's like that clever use of the space yeah. around you, the, the the wings. Yeah. And I remember that was something my my friend Daniel Sauls, who used to intern here. D Jam. Yep. And he told me I was asking him about his approach and he he was always he's always thinking about creating a space for the listener. Not just creating space for the listener, but creating a space, like an imaginary space that the listener can imagine. Well, where is this music? You know, where yeah. are all the yeah. parts of the music? How are they functioning with each other? Like is it a is it a big room? Is it a a little studio? Is it some some guy's bedroom? Is it Bridgestone Arena? Yeah, and that actually reminds me to you know talk about that in in terms of the concept of an entire album itself. Like what wh- what's the space of this entire production that we're doing? You know, mm. um, it recently, uh, well, it's a little again, we're taking the way the time machine here because of uh, when we record this, it comes out later. But uh, not so long ago. Um, Tame Impala just released a new nice. record, and and we were very very honored to actually be sampled on that record. So, recording studio cool. rock stars, um, Jet the Jeff Terzo ec- episode, I uh, got a little sample at the beginning of track eleven, which is really exciting. So, um, Kevin Parker, if you're listening to this episode now, <laughs> shout out to you. Thank you so much, dude. It's an honor to be on your record. Um, but one of the things I, I noticed listening to that was just like the way that. You know, he's putting an album together and it's a lot of, I think it's a lot of programming, a lot of live instruments and stuff, but is but is very careful to sort of um, run the whole thing through an extra level of blender or something and create this new thing and sound mm. that, that just takes the whole production and puts it in a, a space that like, it's, you know, it's the importance of, of creating music and not letting it just be plain, unless maybe it's supposed to be plain. Yeah. But like, you know, saying like, where where are we right now? You know, like, take, let's take you to this new location in sound you've never been to and and just like, just be there, you know, just just live there. Yeah. Um, so I don't know where I'm going with that, but... Uh, I think I think that's a great reminder to always be thinking about, thinking about sound. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about Um an hour ago or yeah, so like was. With, with doorways, for yeah. example, let's talk more about that. So doorways, you had, you know, you started the album. It, it certainly ended with a theme and a, and a story and a message and a thread. And, um, the way, you know, you brought up DJ Daniel Saul. Mm-hmm. So yeah. he added a really cool mm-hmm. element as did Saran joining the record yeah. too. Yeah. That's um, right. Saran Thompson. And so talk a little bit about that, that, that importance of thread and theme and, does that start at the beginning of a record? Does it find its way into the record somewhere in the middle? How does that work for you? Yeah, I'm, I, we kind of took a programmatic approach there where there was a narrative or there is a narrative. Um, I kind of tried to take the listener from where I left off of Songs for a Generation, the first album. And the first thing we hear is just drums and, and kind of like high pass piano. Um, or low, low pass piano, sorry. And then it, you know things sort of open up, and then all of a sudden we're in this in this musical soundscape that sounds nothing like songs for a generation. And and you know Saran wrote a this great spoken word, sort of about walking towards a doorway. I don't want to I don't want to ruin it. I want people to listen to it. But um, the big picture idea was. Was how do we take this musical journey that I've personally been on over the last three years and convey it somehow in a 40, 45 minute record and highlight different experiences of those last three years in um, musical narratives, but, um, some more literal than others. Like the, the last tune, Long Way Home, was written from that perspective of, of being on the road and, and missing home, which I spent a lot of time on the road my first year out with uh, Kevin Taj in 2017. And obviously there was some homesickness there, but then also it's like, when you go through all these things, you feel like, oh, I'm a long way from home, both physically, but also like, I'm a lot different than I was when I was a kid, um, which is sort of what home represents or 
Holm could also represent the first album, Songs for a Generation. Like I'm a lot different musically than I was when I created that as well. Um, and, you know, I wanted to put that at the end and, and sort of have a more reflective sounding piece um, of music to cap it off because it d- really does feel like kind of like a little bit of an exhausting journey for me to, to listen through the record. There's a lot of different things that grab your attention and there's a lot of variety and it's like, it's not exactly jazz. It's not hip hop. It's not soul. It's not blues, but there's elements of all of it in there. And so I wanted that to sort of, I wanted the whole album as a concept to kind of reflect the feeling of what it was like to, to be fresh out of school, to really be a green in a lot of different areas musically and, and to just be constantly learning and constantly growing and, and be exploring things, be interested to, you know, to go to, to London, to go to Ronnie Scott's, to hear somebody play there, then to fly to India, hear music there, you know, to play the Montreux Jazz Festival, to be able to check out the North Sea Jazz Festival, to hear some of my heroes who are all over the map in terms of jazz genre, if you will, um, and then to be influenced by it. It's not, it, it is cohesive in a way, it's cohesive and indicative of my authentic experience over the last three years, but to someone who doesn't know that, the feeling might be like, maybe it's a little sporadic at, at points. And if so, that's certainly intentional because my experience was that. Right, it's a collection of different different uh, musical perspectives. Totally. But it's not done in like a hit you over the head way. It's like, no. Yeah, I tried to make it a little more subtle. Like that, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you, you uh, cover a Herbie Hancock song mm-hmm. in the album. Tell us about that one. Yeah, I, I've, I had not recorded a cover of anything up to that point. And I, I wanted to include something. I figured if I was going to include a cover, who would I cover? And the obvious answer to me was Herbie because he's, one, he's, he's a huge musical influence. But I also got a chance to actually meet him when we were in Molde, which is in Norway, playing the Molde Jazz Festival in 2017. And it turns out he and Keb were friends back in their Los Angeles days. Keb used to live out in LA, grew up in Compton, and um, they practiced Buddhism together for some 20 odd years. And that's how they got to know each other. And um, so we were in Norway, overlapped with um, Herbie's band, Vinnie Calouette on on drums, and James Genus on bass, um, Lionel Lueke on guitar, Terrace Martin, who's an amazing uh, hip hop producer and and saxophonist, keyboard. I mean, he really does it all. Um, and, and they invited us to their, um, to their sound check, which was pretty much just an hour show. They just played <laughs> for an hour <laughs> right, and their nice. sound guy just dialed it in. Um, and so we got to check that out. And then we went backstage and, and talked with them and, and I got to talk to Herbie and, and I walked up to him and he said, Oh, are these the hands that I got to break? <laughs> and I was like, Oh, that's a, I'll like take a joke it. is in I'll like you're, you're the young competition now or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, something That's like that. Hilarious. That's funny. And um, and then we got to check out their their show later that night, and and so it was an amazing experience to get a talk and and hear them and and be just in close proximity to some of these living legends. Yeah. And so I figured, you know, that was that was notable enough for me to uh, sort of give a musical nod to Herbie and, and cover Cantaloupe Island. It's kind of this yeah. um, deconstructed, de- discombobulated arrangement, derangement, as yeah, my friend Marcus Finney would like say. Like um, yeah, we wanted to do one of those. And and so that was the, actually the only cover that was included on, on Doorways. Everything else is original. Yeah, uh, I didn't know Cantaloupe Island until you guys were playing it. But um, tell us a little bit about Marcus Finney, too, because an amazing drummer. And when you guys hit the outro of that album and you were trying to dial it in and get it right, I was just like, I realized that I had finally hit a, a thing where, like, my musical understanding just wasn't, like, I just had to just trust that you guys knew what was going on because I, I didn't understand the details and the subtleties of where you guys were headed enough to know yeah, to and give you feedback at that point. Sure, and that's actually a, a good point because remembering back to that session, we used the technology here in the studio to kind of like weave us through the challenge of that. We were doing this big like polyrhythm, like a big three against four in terms of like measures, um, like four measures against three measures kind of thing. Um, which if you listen to it, you'll hear it's the outro of uh, Cantaloupe is what, what we named it on Doorways. But we were, yeah, we were in here trying to figure it out and we were trying to play it. And then 
Then all of a sudden, Marks and I were just like, what if we just played it a few times? One of them is going to be right. Then we'll just <laughs> command C, command V, V, command V, command V. Command. And so we just created a literal loop, which is partially why I call it cantaloupe. Is because we had to, in the studio, just get it right once. And then we weren't, in that moment, we weren't able to do it right eight times. So right. we just we just copied and pasted it. Um, and we were still trying to figure out exactly what we were what it is do, we right? were trying to do. Because it's like a process of having a plan, but also writing in the studio. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And plus we wanted horns to be soloing over that. And if we weren't solid groove wise, there's no way that we could expect them to, yeah. to cut something that yeah. would, would be appropriate. So yeah, Marcus is a great, great friend. He toured with Tajmo as well. Tajmo and Kemos. Marcus has a hell of a good deep pocket. Oh man, he's amazing. Uh, tours with Kirk Whalem currently. Um, used to tour with Larry Carlton and Donna Summer. Uh, has his own project, the Marcus Finney Band, and um, is will be releasing singles. So regardless of our time travel situation, when this comes out, he will have put out uh, at least one, two, or three singles uh, under his own name. Definitely check him out. Amazing drummer. That's awesome. If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you're going to need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics and Riga Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique golden drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting colorations and distortions. This is my voice right now on the new Amethyst microphone with Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring an expensive sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Amethyst microphone at jayzmic.com. During the height of record making, Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, Ardent Studios, and the New York City Record Plant all turned to one company to build their consoles. That company is now Spectra 1964, carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. The extremely stable, high-speed circuit design of the 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you cleaner, punchier, dynamic recordings. Spectra 1964 brings you the sound of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and so many more. Created by the missile engineers who are central in rolling out the systems that protected the free world for over half a century, Spectra 1964 literally brings rocket science to your studio. With the STX 600 mic pre with built-in comp limiter, full frequency passive BBDI, and C610 dedicated comp limiter, start making records that last a life time at spectra1964.com. Well, so speaking of proximity to Herbie Hancock, here's another one for you. On this podcast, now that you're a recording studio rock star, um, another guest on the podcast is Michael Beinhorn, who I look forward to having back on the show. Sure. And he recorded Rocket. That was his, That's one crazy. Of his first gigs. You know, That's amazing. For Herbie Hancock, you know? And yeah. I remember... Growing up and then like watching the cool video with like the, you know, the robot mannequins. I'm like, oh my God, that's the coolest thing yeah, I've ever seen. the guitar and everything. Yeah, talk about getting sampled. I mean, that thing's been sampled dozens, I mean, hundreds of times probably. Yeah, yeah and I mean, I, you, you have to wonder what was going through. I mean, maybe you don't, maybe you already know the answer to this, but what was going through Herbie's head oh, I don't at know that time answer. talking about the ideas of... um Trusting your own voice, you know, not trying to do it the right way, just do it the way that is is right for you and let it yeah. be, you know. Or the sound of 2020. Right. Was that yeah. the sound of 19, what was it, 83 or something sure, like that? Sure, yeah, around then. I think um, the great jazz musicians have always found a way to interact with culture in a relevant way. And that doesn't ever mean selling out. Like if you look at Miles Davis, actually most people don't know that Miles Davis's last album, it's called Doobop, and um, 92, 93, maybe around then, within a couple of years of that at least. And it's pretty much him 
playing the trumpet, normal trumpet sound for the most part, and improvising over these kind of like, these just like hip hop, kind of lo-fi hip hop tracks. And there's like, I don't know how many, maybe it's a dozen tracks on this record, but that's that's where he went out. And then he, he died, I think around 93, 94. But when, when he died, like that was the most recent thing that he had recorded, which is remarkable. And you, you know, you talk about Rocket, which definitely has like a, a hip hop electronic music yeah, influence yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so these guys are, are, yeah, who knows what was going through their mind, but I think they were definitely interacting in whatever capacity with the relevant culture. And that, you know, I think music is um, without a doubt uh, related to culture. That's something that Taj Mahal would always talk about is the importance of music coming from the culture and then sort of these days in some circles it's backwards where the culture started coming from the music, which is an interesting, right, different sort of change in direction. But um, well, it's like a it's like a two way dialogue. Yeah, you know for sure. Yeah, I mean that actually makes me think of a topic that's come up for me a bunch. Is I've you know uh, so I don't think I've even announced this on the show yet. Now of course this will be a little bit after the fact too, but. Um, the Bonnaroo hay bale studio that I've done for 15 years is, is finally no more. It's actually, this was the, oh, wow. the year that they finally decided that they didn't want to do the whole radio compound and the backstage studio and everything. Wow. And I, I would say that our studio is a direct reflection of bands performing together and the value of that in a, in a festival sure. situation and, and the connection to radio and, and, you know, having recorded content to share that's a, you know, an, um, a special performance, yeah, you know, that could, for example, be played by some people on acoustic guitar and harmonizing voices and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also a reflection of what I've seen in the change of music at the festival level. And then, you know, recently on the Grammys with Billie Eilish winning the Grammys, you know, multiple Grammys this, this past year. Um, and it's that concept of, you know, this kind of bass program music, with hi hats and vocals and everything, and and the stuff that's gone on there, you know, the the laptop meets vocal mic kind of um, music creation, mm-hmm. and there's been a lot of music that, as I've gotten older and and my kid grows up and starts to like, and I see other people liking, there's there's certainly music out there that I hear and I'm like, I just don't get this, you know, sure. and, I, yeah. and I'm not trying to be Mr. Grumpy Pants, no, 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 I'm just saying it, yeah. like I genuinely like. Part of me is like this doesn't this doesn't necessarily trigger like my uh, sensory receptors <laughs> in the right way. However, I know enough to know that if people are really enjoying it, it's there's something going on that I just don't understand yet. You know? Yeah. And and I've seen that part of that is like you know to go see like the bass the this sort of like super sub bass production with the hi hats happening at a festival. It's also, you begin to see it's about that interplay between what's coming off the speakers off the stage and how it hits the audience and goes back. And I guess that was a long way of describing, of A, telling everybody that the Hay Bale Studio is not happening. <laughs> right. But also like, you know, circling back to what you said about, you know, is it the culture that influences the music or is it the music that influences the culture? Or is it just that that feedback loop Chicken and egg on, thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I think it is a two-way street, like you said, and- um, I think great music is certainly always relevant to the culture, either as a, I think it's always a response. You can't help. It's sort of like the, uh, the idea that everything is political in a way. Like even abstaining from political stuff is in a way political. Um, it's like, you know, even with the uh, the home studio thing right now, people who are, who are interested in it are you know are interested in making this change to the law are um, they're deciding to engage with it and that's a reflection people who are saying you know I'm not really sure about this that is also a reflection of um, how they feel about the issue I think every the way everyone reacts whether it's you know they're they're scared or they don't know or whatever I still think there's probably a a, a middle ground of people who are um, you know this is sort of unrelated but it's interesting to me that how everything is um is related to to e- each other. I don't know. Yeah. Well, so what are some things that you see surrounding you and jazz music um you know in in your world where you're you're feeling like this is inspiring and this is a new direction for the culture of jazz? 
Is there anything that comes to mind or any any just bands that you've just been really excited to discover recently? Well, I've been I've been checking. Well, I'm always fascinated with with how technology and in informs creativity for sure, and and vice versa, of course. How creativity informs um, the, te- the techno- technological advances. Um, so you know, continuing to explore synths, both uh, analog and digital synths, for me is is interesting. Um, there there are a few artists who are um, particularly, you know, I've been interested in like not so much jazz uh, recently. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, Snarky Puppy, for example, was a band reference that kept kept coming up. Yeah, I we think were- they're, they're they're doing some amazing things. I think the model that they've kind of helped pioneer it's no in no way completely original but it's i think to a lot of uh, people my age generationally it is it does feel original yeah um and of course i, I don't want to not include uh, brad moldau was coming up as well as yeah too, so yeah was i was gonna say there. brad moldau and, and the fact that he just won the grammy for oh, yeah, the I'm best sorry, jazz album that, yeah. um which is crazily enough his first grammy win ever which is mind boggling to me but of course well deserved and certainly overdue and um speaking of Brad Meldow um talk about a jazz artist who has made an effort to collaborate within the pop world with so many people i feel like i've just i keep seeing him you know rocking out i mean i don't remember that he he i think he showed up after frank zappa was here but he would have definitely done a collaboration with frank zappa oh, too I totally think, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Brad is one of these guys who who have always, I think, just been so fascinated with music as a whole and never gotten stuck in one thing. Um, he's always exploring. Like he he did this uh, duo project with Mark Juliana, who's an amazing drummer, who was actually the drummer on David Bowie's last album. Um, but the two of them, uh, Brad Meldo and Mark Juliana, did a duo record called Meliana, I think, and it's kind of this futuristic, electronic, jazz fusion. Really crazy drum, percussion, synth kind of sounds, keyboard sounds. And that's, I mean, that came out years ago, but that's always interesting for me to listen to. And um, I've also been interested in like non-Western music too recently. Like, I've Yeah, well, you just discover new stuff on the road? Yeah, kind of. And I I went down this sort of flamenco rabbit hole for a while, and we, we recorded some stuff that has yet to see the light of day. But um, yeah, both both just listening to flamenco music, and uh, yeah, it's just it's so different than what I'm used to. Listen, I mean, they conceptualize music in a completely different way than like traditional classical Western art music or any sort of like cultural music that I've interacted with. And in a lot of ways, it actually parallels jazz because it's a, a real melding of and fusions of a lot of different cultural um, people. Yeah. Um, Do you feel like you have a particularly versatile and and like flexible opportunity as a as a, a an academic and a, and somebody who can really study music that like you you can discover something like flamenco? And be like, oh, listen to all the stuff going. On. I'm just gonna like go in that direction and now study this and like make an album where I'm, where I'm, you know, using this kind of musical lexicon, I guess. I'm yeah. Searching for words. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I think I'm, I'm always hesitant to try to claim ownership of anything. Like I don't know flamenco music the way that someone who grew up in Andalusia in right. Southern Spain is going to know it. Right. And so I don't want to ever come off that way, but I'm certainly fascinated in it. And if I feel like I've created something that is authentically a reflection of my fascination with it, then sure, I'll, I'll put it out. But I don't want people to get the wrong idea. Like, this guy thinks he can just go anywhere and explore music for a year or, or a few years even and, and put something out thinking that it's, it's authentic, uh, authentic or something. Or something. Right, right. Um, just don't use the word. We'll never use the word authentic there we go. again. Yeah, that was yeah, it. Yeah, we, we discarded that, that word. It's gone. <laughs> um, what are some things about flamenco? How would you describe some of the elements that you have heard in it um, what are some of the instruments? What are some of the yeah. rhythmic stuff that that is cool about it to you? Well, I think the the coolest part to me that caught me off guard initially was how it sounds like um, kind of Middle Eastern music, and like melodically and a little bit harmonically, but like the melodies and like the vocalisms sound like they belong in like Persia or Arabia or something. 
And as I started digging, I realized that there was this, this thread of um, music from northern India, from uh, northern Africa, from Morocco, um, from uh, people in Turkey, from people in Greece, from the people who are living in southern Spain, the people who, like classical music, like the guitar is, of course, the, the biggest instrument, a most prominent instrument in, in flamenco, guitar, voice, and then a lot of like hand claps. But then as it's sort of been globalized further into the, you know, the 20th and 21st centuries. Basically gets a 4-4 kick drum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> could be, could be. Uh, as it's as fused with, with jazz a little bit more, um, it's just amazing to see how it can be a vehicle for like, different cultures to meet and interact with each other. I think that's what in, interests me the most about it. And it's the fact that it's still kind of underground, kind of like it's people associate flamenco music with like going on vacation in, in Spain and being on a beach and sipping, you know, whatever. The and, Gypsy Kings. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, but it's so deep and there's, there's a real authenticity to the, to the music. I use that word again, but um, I think that's what fascinates me about it. And it, it doesn't sound like if we want to get real nerdy with like some of the musical aspects of it, it doesn't really behave harmonically in the ways that Western music expects music to behave. Yeah. Um, like the classic five one in um like dominant tonic motion in in Western classical music or in Western pop music even is not really found um in a lot of flamenco music. A lot of it is like a flat two to major one, both major chords. And so you get this- Which is a half step, right? Half step, yeah. yeah but yeah. like parallel major chords. And- Which that, that, that works for us in the indie rock scene. You yeah, know? sure. You learn your bar chord and then you just go down a half step and you're like, that sounds cool. Totally. And, and of course, it's elements of that have, and people probably discover that independently of flamenco music too. But it's cool. Like they don't really have a five to one function other than the flat two to major one. And I think that's cool. I think- and then, you know, that's just a very basic generalization, of and when course. And when you say the function, you're talking about like this, a sense of resolve. Exactly. Yeah, a sense of tension and resolution. Yeah. And that's just talking harmonically. And then there's all sorts of rhythms and different... And a different scale, right? Um, yeah, there's, there's different... Some, yeah. That's what I, you know, I don't know how to describe it, but the... You know, yeah, yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Just, I love that sound. And, yeah. You know, and my dad, of course, was like in the first Peace Corps mission to, to Turkey. Okay. In the 60s, so... Yeah. I probably heard a little bit of his music. You know, he had some vinyl records and yeah. got a little influence there. But something about Middle East, and I did travel when I was six. I did get to go to Turkey, actually, and go to, nice. go to Greece and stuff. But something about uh, Middle Eastern melodies and, and scales and stuff really resonates with me. Yeah, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. Like, it's very evocative of something, and we can't really say why or yeah. what it is, but we're all drawn to it. And so that's, I'm no urgency. different. There's an urgency in the scale itself, I yeah. feel like. Yeah, a major scale is not very urgent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it? Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's a little more complacent. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, maybe if you know how to do the major scale the right way, you probably do. You can probably <laughs> find some urgency in it, but it's more like everything's cool, like everything fits. Yeah. Know? Right. But then, then that brings up the question: Is that only because I grew up with the major scale? Right. There know? we go. And there's another rabbit hole. Yeah. It would be hard to describe in one sentence what gives records a legendary sound, but it would be easy to describe in three letters, API. For more than 50 years, API Audio has created large format consoles for world-class studios. Famous for co-founder Saul Walker's circuit designs and the original 2520 op amp, the sound of API consoles is the sound of great music. API now brings that legendary sound to your home studio with The Box, a small format console featuring the famous API circuitry that is the perfect analog addition for your digital studio. The Box gives you eight recording channels on the left with built-in mic pre's, high-pass filters, direct inputs and custom loadable 500 module slots, and 16 summing channels on the right, or mix using all 24 channels, including aug sends, inserts, and silky smooth faders, feeding a master section with classic API compression, switchable monitor sends, and a pro talkback switch, and you've just upgraded your studio to legend status with The Box from APIaudio.com. 
Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer and a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins in PreSonus Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. What do we want to do? Should we talk about that topic for just a second? The the concept of what, you know, why certain things, aspects in music are familiar to us and mm. how that might just have to do with the fact that, you know, we, we grew up with that being presented to us as the way that it's done versus, you know, any kind of universal concepts. There must be some concepts mm-hmm. of music that people begin to recognize as universally true, yeah. you know? Well, there's this great YouTube video. It may have been like a TEDx conference or something. Maybe you've seen it where um, Bobby McFerrin, Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Where he's he's leading the audience and he's just jumping and he teaches them like a couple notes. He's basically for people who haven't seen it, um, who haven't seen it yet. He's he's jumping around on this imaginary keyboard on the ground and he's he's basically associating a note with his position on the ground and and he ch- shows the audience a few um, a few notes and then he starts jumping around and they start singing notes in unison all together that he hadn't taught them. And by the end of the couple minutes of the demonstration, he has everybody singing the pentatonic scale, which uh, for people who, who may not know, that's the first, second, third, fifth, and sixth scale degree, all major scale degrees. And and uh, I think that's the closest thing to like a universal musical language, is the pen, or, or one of the many things, yeah. is the pentatonic scale. Um, and yeah, I remember- Frank Zappa- Said, I remember reading that he said it was like that was his favorite scale. You know? Yeah, that's one of the things. The f- first thing I learned on guitar too. Yeah, totally. But but the Bobby McFerrin video is so great. It's too. so cool. Yeah, and to to help clarify, paint that picture a little bit. He actually teaches, if, as I recall, he teaches a few notes, uh-huh. and then he jumps one step further, and he doesn't say anything exactly. at all, and the audience just automatically sings the right note in the pentatonic right. scale. Right, yeah. I think he, he was jumping down from the first scale degree down to the sixth. And instead of going to the seventh, everyone's saying the, the sixth, right. which is part of the pentatonic yeah. scale. And that's amazing. And so, yeah, I think there are some aspects to music that are maybe if you want to, if you subscribe, like it's within us or something, or part of our DNA as humans, we kind of resonate on certain levels. Yeah. Um, I think there are there is uh, validity to things like that. You know, the Pythagorean theorem, how Pythagoras determined like, Different overtones and, and things way yeah. back when and Fibonacci, yeah, and, you know, yeah. the golden mean and all that yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, I don't know enough about that to make a bold claim, but doesn't mean it's gonna stop me from saying that there's probably there's some probably something there. Yeah, exactly. There's probably something there. Now in your tour, uh your touring experience and hanging out with Jeff Coffin and you know, kind of, you know, brushing brushing up with the the jam kind of jam band scene out there in the world too. Um, you know, which obviously exists in that, in that, in the the festivals and the tours mm, and stuff. Yeah. What have you heard or learned about um, tunings? You know, we we take something like A four forty quite for granted here mm. in Western culture, but that's just a that's just a number of cycles per second <clears throat> that we've decided <throat> equals the key of A. Right. Have you learned anything about you know alternate tunings yet, or is that just the next? That's actually. To that's something um, that I was learning more and thinking more about when I was in music school because uh, Bach, um, J.S. Bach, in his time in the Baroque era, actually tuned down closer to like a half step down from what we would call A, like A, I don't know the exact number, but like 415 or something, just to present a random number. Um, um, or something around there. I, I don't know exactly, but there, yeah, there have been various tunings. I think only recently, within recently meaning the last hundred or so years, have we really locked into 440. But that was something I, I learned more about when I was th- listening to. It always bothered me <laughs> growing up as a kid because I, you know, I have I have perfect pitch and 
growing up, I would be learning a piece, uh, like say it's in like C major or something, and I listen to someone play it on a harpsichord or even someone play it on like a period piano um, um, from the classical era. And I'd be hearing it and it's like, it's a lot closer to B major than C major. Now, why is that? And, it would, and then you know, I'd ask my piano teacher and she would explain it to me. Um, but yeah, actually most recently I've been just trying to memorize frequencies just for fun because I'd be on the road and, and um, it's a lot of fun at sound check to be, you know, doing something and be like, oh, that's, you know, the, I just memorize all the low mids anywhere from like C3 all the way up to C5, um, which, yeah, so you'd be like, oh yeah, that's like 160 hertz or 163 hertz or um, 261 or, you know, you, you start memorizing certain numbers. You yeah. can tell people what, what they are in a, in a, in a nice way, not trying to be a, an asshole about it or anything, but that's just fun for me because I, I do have perfect pitch and so instead of just knowing the note name, now I can like link it to an actual frequency that could be useful for like the monitor guy or the front of house guy. So what does perfect pitch mean? It means it means the ability to for somebody to play a note on an instrument and you can say what that note is. Yeah. Yeah. What exactly. if what if that instrument was out of tune? Well then there's different so you can think of perfect pitch as like a a spectrum. So, you know, the people who have like crazy perfect pitch could tell you like how many cents sharp. Wow. Or a sense flat, or like a ten, ten cents sharp. So fifty cents would be a full half step. Yeah. Um, someone could say, "Oh, that's like twenty-five, like right in the middle." And you get into quarter tones and stuff. The uh, the notes in between in the cracks of the piano. Um, but yeah, I like. It's fun for me to to just memorize frequencies. One because I was just bored on the road and I wanted something to do. But then every every day we'd be sound checking, and Keb has a lot of different guitars, and some are steel guitars, and some are you know, hollow bodies, and so all of them resonate slightly differently and every hall is different, every club or whatever is going to be different. And so inevitably there's going to be some sort of frequency, whether it's something high or something in the, in the mids or something that I can be yeah. like, that's just a fun thing to do. And you could probably hear a particular note singing a little more in a space. Right? Exactly. Yeah, and then I, and I kind of find it and be like, oh yeah, that's G or something. That's yeah. like 196. Hertz. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. So, you know, even the idea of per- perfect pitch, I remember I, at one point, I probably still have it somewhere, it was like a series of CDs where you could train yourself to perfect pitch. And I used to drive around uh, Nashville trying to see if I could guess. And I get so frustrated because I wasn't very good at guess at figuring it out, getting past the basics. Yeah. But it was that idea that you, that perfect pitch isn't, I think a lot of times people think about it as something you're just, you, you're born with it or you're not born with it. And, and I think it's like um, being good at math. It's not really true. It's like, you know, it's an exercise. It's a muscle that you train. Yeah. You know? Was that something that you proactively pursued? Or is, did no. it just sort of come with the territory of playing so much music for so long? I think, think that's, that's what happened to me was just I grew up listening to a lot of music, even though my parents weren't musicians. But we'd always have music playing in the car or at home. And I, was, I started music when I was four years old. Right. <clears throat> and, and played regularly. Oh, yeah. I was at the piano probably every day just about. Yeah, and so I spent a lot of time. I think it's probably time dependent more than anything else. But you know, we'll, we'll talk about Rick Beato again. He's he has a uh, ear training book now. You know, his son. I don't know if you've seen that kid who, right. who has like the crazy. His name's Dylan. That was one of the first viral videos. Yeah. I think, that helped launch uh, Rick's yeah. own video channel. Exactly, and you know, Rick would just play like eight notes on the piano, like boom, 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 and just play this massive chord. Be like, Dylan, what notes are that? And then his kid would just sing each note and tell him like A flat, G, B, whatever, you know, and those aren't the notes. But um he Rick Rick has a two things out. He's he's got like a a method for uh parents to and, and I haven't tried this out, so I'm not vouching for it. This is just what I've read on his website of um this basically this high information music that will help your baby's brain develop in such a way that it will be like a sponge and supposedly help the kid develop similar type superhuman <laughs> perfect pitch abilities like his son Dylan. Um, I think all the information is on his website. And then he also has a recently put out uh, ear training method for all ages that I think will help people develop great relative pitch, if not perfect pitch. Because I think Rick does believe that perfect pitch is something where there is a window from the time you're born to 
I don't know what age, but sometime in, in the in the early childhood. I wonder what Rick thinks in that context about the new style of sub bass music going on. Mm. Cause that's a, there's a lot of kids growing up right now. And yeah. what they're hearing is like, Ooh, yeah, I thought about the other, the, time, the other yeah. day I went to this, uh, to the Lumineers concert at Bridgestone last week and man, it was just so loud and I forgot earplugs and I was, I, I, I wish that I had brought them. Let's talk about earplugs for a sec. Let's yeah. educate. Um, so I was young. I was young once <laughs> and I thought it was cool to like go and I don't want earplugs. It sounds stupid. You know, like yeah. I can't hear what's going on with the stuff. And then I also thought it was fun to like kind of get numbed into the music at a loud show. And isn't that a trip to just like go up and just be swallowed and all that bass and the speakers and right in your feel face it. and yeah. everything, feel it. And then by the time I was about 25, when I was starting to make some music professionally records, you know, I, Somewhere in the in the pre twenty five years, I'd have the experience of going to a show. It was loud, or a rehearsal that was loud, and then afterwards, you like ring like, oh, shit, man, it's so funny, my ears are ringing. You hear that? Yeah. Your ears ringing, you know. And then it goes away, and you're like back to normal. But then at twenty five, making records professionally, first time ever, like start doing long days in studios. Come yeah. home afterwards and wake up the next morning, and I'll be like, oh, I hear, I can tell there's like you know. There's noises that don't go away now, you know, I yeah. get really worried about it. But that helped um, prompt me to adopt the habit of always carrying earplugs around. Yeah. Uh, and I like to have foam ones, you know, yeah. just like yeah. I've tried the fancy ones. Yeah. I'm not looking for, you know, balanced um, frequencies. I'm looking for something that blocks out as much sound as possible. And I've actually learned that I get more bass at shows. Because I've I, now I'm like now everything sounds right to me if I get earplugs in it it's just like this yeah. is kicking right yeah I I think that's important I think it's important especially you bring up the point you're probably daughter your daughter probably listens to music with a lot of low frequencies and stuff and um I mean every kid daughter <laughs> her sisters like any any younger person yeah usually is like no I don't need earplugs I yeah right I, I offer them yeah. I always try and bring more than one pair with me when yeah. I go to someplace loud. <laughs> yeah, I was so bummed when I forgot them. Usually, usually I'll have them, but it's um, yeah, and the ring in your ears. I, I have a friend who who played a rehearsal once or a show, and he's a bass player, and he was standing right next to the the crash cymbal around the drummer's right side, and he has like quarter of his hearing loss in his left ear just from that one experience because it was just so loud, and that cymbal just sort of like carved out those those frequencies, and he doesn't have them anymore. And so I think it's real. I think ear fatigue is real. I think anyone who's uh, been in the studio for a long day can attest to that. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything, any other replacement from just kind of silence, yeah. moving yourself from it. So rock stars, just to kind of keep riffing on that topic, because for those of you who haven't thought about this, um, it's super, super important that you take it really seriously. Just carry foam earplugs in your yeah. right pocket if you're righty like me all the time, you know. Left pocket if you're lefty. There you go. <laughs> and uh, and just have them with you so that like anytime there's ever something loud going on, you just pop them in. Um, one of the things that um, I actually find is a great benefit is at a loud concert, you know, people, they lean over and they start yelling in your ear to talk to you, which just makes it like 10 times louder in your yeah. ear. But if you get your earplugs sunk in deep, then now I'm like, I lean in close so they can just talk through the earplug and I can hear them. And it's like a totally reasonable volume. There you go. It doesn't bother me at all. But our ears are, are, you know, it's a fluid in there. And inside the ear are all these little teeny tiny hairs mm. that vibrate from the fluid vibrating. And the volume basically just flattens those hairs out. And we begin to lose different frequencies. I, I, th I can't remember. I think the highs have to travel the furthest into our ear. I might get that backwards, but maybe maybe they're maybe they don't have to travel the furthest. Maybe the lows travel the furthest. Mm -hmm. But the um, the high frequencies, those little teeny tiny hairs, they just get killed off. Yeah, they just die and they don't come back. So right. you don't want that to happen. And I think also like just your brain, you know the. Your brain's just like, well, I don't need to be paying attention to that frequency anymore, you know? Right. So, yeah. you know, it's a combination of all of those things, but it's very, very serious and something that we should all take seriously enough. The, the sooner you learn to, like, have your plugs in, 
Thanks, yeah. thanks for just hearing me out, Dave. It's the, it's the responsible <laughs> thing. It's the responsible thing to do. All right, cool. So um, rhythm section. Yeah. You talked about having Marcus Finney in the studio. Yeah. Talk about the importance when you're performing in the studio, um, even on stage, of finding the right rhythm section to play with you. Wow. Talk about the challenges of doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, if you can think of anything, talk about the challenges of being honest about when the rhythm section isn't right. And when, because I mean, if you're going to play with people and discover people, you have to play with the wrong people too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know we're not going to name drop one. here, no, but, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, just what have you learned well, about I'll, that? I'll name process? drop that some of my favorite people. Um, uh, a lot of whom were, I was very lucky to have on the, on doorways, but yeah, man, rhythm section, that's, that's a huge one. I think, uh, time is probably the most important aspect to me that is not really compromisable. Like everyone se- needs to own their own sense of time and time is fluid. You know, I'm not one of these people who are, who subscribe to, there's only one like it's got to be on the grid or else it's, you know, rushing is wrong, dragging is wrong. Well, no, there's there's times when that's appropriate and times when that actually feels better than if everything's on a click locked into a grid. But regardless, everyone still needs to have an ownership of the time. Um, I think sounds are also a big part of, of that. I think low end can be really tricky, um, especially with like electric bass. So finding someone who really understands not only their own sound on stage, but how their sound translates out there. Um, whether you're you know, like at Rudy's Jazz Room or, you know, playing Bridgestone Arena or something. And obviously, you know, in the larger venues, you have someone help you dial that in. But either way, you need to be aware of what that sounds like. And then um, I think it's also just like going back to it because it's so important to me personally is willingness to listen and, and willingness to leave space I think especially for for bass players, you know, you can create that artificially, you know, in the studio, but people who are willing to leave space in the in the moment live, that is really important and a and a mark of a a great bass player. Someone who takes like for my music, I'm looking for people who are who are willing and versed in sort of that studio, mainstream studio sensibility, but who are able to have, learn how to like, how do I translate that to like a more high energy, more risk-taking, improvisational musical setting. And it's a balance. That's why like Marcus Finney, who we mentioned earlier on drums, is like the perfect guy for me because he has played so many sessions and he has toured so much and worked in like very disciplined musical settings where he's had to play parts but then he also knows how to unleash like crazy and can play more notes than anyone else I know and more subdivisions than anyone else I know. And it's amazing and virtuosic. But then he also has that discipline and that sensibility. And then, you know, we played um, last week, uh, this would have been whenever, um, with Jay White on bass, who's, who's an amazing bass player who just moved to Nashville, who plays with Amos Lee and, and plays with a lot of the Snarky Puppy crew. Um, electric bass player and he's also his own artist he does a lot of singing and playing but he is I mean his pocket his time is just second to none but then he's also you know played enough sessions and coming out of the the gospel world a little bit where he he knows when to leave space and how to create momentum with with space but then also you know he's virtuosic like anybody else um, so I think it's a balance of those things uh, for me um, Willingness to listen, really dialing in sounds, and and if it's my gig, then people who are really teachable and are willing to, um, willing to try things and experiment. Yeah, your songs aren't exactly just like one, four, five jams. No, <laughs> right. <laughs> A little more complicated than that. Um, but it's interesting. You talk about the importance of space on bass, and it's one of those places where space on bass doesn't just mean like. Just don't play the note on that bar necessarily. Like there is little teeny spaces between the end of a long note and the beginning of the next long note. Yeah, or whatever. the attack. They're so like that lets the attack like really resonate. Bass, yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, with some bass, you know, with some of this modern bass music we talk about, sometimes it's like, right. And it's always there or whatever. Yeah. 
And then the only space maybe is like in the buildup before the, the <laughs> drop right. again. But uh, on an electric bass, you know, with somebody playing, if you, when you don't leave that, the, the just right space before the next attack of the next note, it's like you don't get a next attack on the next note. You don't, there's no power in the next note, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And I find that to be really an important as- aspect of it. What about bass and piano? Like, uh, you know, in rock and pop production and stuff like that, that can become a challenge you have to discover. It's like, yeah, you know, if you played the piano b- by yourself, you might be like, ooh, listen to my octaves yeah, on the left, left hand. hand yeah. you know? How do, w- what do we need to know about those those two worlds living together? Well, I think there's two thoughts that I have. One is... Um, like in the in the chain of recording and putting out music, um, Keb will always tell me he thinks it's best to do the mixing as early on as possible, which is to say, mix, avoid mixing problems by just playing the appropriate part. And so I don't need to be playing those octaves in my left hand if the bass player is occupying those frequencies necessarily. Now, if you want a little overlap, that's great. Um, but why compromise the sound more so, you know, with like a, obviously you can like high pass it later and just remove, create a little bit more space for the bass if you want. But why even go there if you, if you don't have to? And so there are things, you know, sometimes it sounds great to have the bass and the left hand octaves doubling um, or the piano sustaining some of that low end and you, you high pass it a little bit, but it's still sustaining and the bass is playing a more active part, you know, Again, it's, it's kind of song dependent, but I try to stay out of that range a lot of times, unless it's a very specifically doubled or tripled line, left hand and bass or something. But I think most of the time it doesn't really, it doesn't really do any good. It creates a little bit more, probably more problems than it's worth for for me. Um, yeah, especially when you have a kick drum, you know. Right. There's a lot of a lot of low end, you just have to make decisions and you got to prioritize what, who's going to be occupying these frequencies or, or where, and um, making those decisions as early on as possible in that chain, starting with when you're recording, I think is really beneficial and can save time later on. Do kick drums and bass notes belong together or should they not be played at the same time? (laughs) Yeah, there's no right answer to that. No right answer to that. All right, cool. (laughs) Um, I will say on the, I think every song is different, but as a sweeping generalization, um, I find that a lot of times the the bass is carrying the low end on the keb gig more right. often than the kick drum. The kick drum, you know, has a little bit more um, mid yeah, punch totally low to mid it. or something. Yeah, like exactly. That. And, and the bass is really Soft. sort of that. Yeah, yeah. But you know. I don't want to go out on a limb saying that either as a generalization because it, it is song specific. Yeah. But it's it's just that reminder that you have to, these are questions you have to ask yourself when yeah. you're, when you are planning mm-hmm. the intent of the song and the production too. Yeah. It's like, what should this bass feel like? You know, what should the low end of this song feel like? Yeah. And it's a mixing um, decision that helps me when I'm, when I'm working on a song is to think about like, okay, what, what would feel right, you know? And it's like, yeah. okay, if the bass is like, that's like mm-hmm. what I want, then don't try and make the kick, you know, compete with that. And and it, it's like you were saying, there's there's only so much room in the low end. Yeah, it's like the the um, cycles of the frequencies. There, there's not there's fewer cycles between between each waveform, you know. Right. So it's like. You have to, you can't have everybody, it's easier or it's easier for things to step on each other, I think, you know. I agree. Yeah. Also, I'm thinking about you talking about like that, that, uh, you know, like don't use your left hand. And for somebody like you, there has to be some part of you that goes, but this is, I'm just playing a triad. This is too easy. Like yeah. I must not be doing enough or something. And it reminds me to think that, like, when things feel too easy in the studio, maybe the answer is just listen harder, for, like, for all of us. Like, sometimes mm. the simplest part can become challenging again just by the, just through the act of listening really intently to what's coming out of the sound. Yeah, and hopefully it's not 
just about the part. Hopefully the part is servicing, again, the whole, which is greater than the sum of the parts, which we mentioned earlier. And um, yeah, I, I do fight that sometimes. It's like, but then I just have to remind myself, it comes back to that humility, the importance of the humility. It's, it's not, I don't need to be going 100% on every single thing or not even every single solo either. Like not every single solo needs to build from zero to 100. Right, you know? right. Otherwise, you're, you're like, where, does, where do you go? Where do you go from there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> More Spinal Tap. Do you feel like the time you spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here are just some of the things students are saying about the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass. Absolutely the most informed Formative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process I have ever been a part of. That was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour lesson. David P. Thanks for a great session, dude. Just when I needed the inspiration. John F. A true feat of greatness. It was really life-changing and worth way more than I paid. Mark R. I've literally watched it two times at length, taken a plethora of notes, then combed back over some sections even more. You guys really knocked it out of the park on this one, and it was so incredibly eye-opening and useful immediately. What else can I say? Shane J. Amazing masterclass with Craig Alvin. My biggest takeaway was the concept of adding a subtle combination of distortion and compression to achieve a buttery coat cohesion in the sound, but there is so much more. Steve K. Listen, I appreciate you listening to this podcast, and I know you're trying to make your best record ever, but when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy-winning quality, then you're ready for UltimateMixingMasterclass.com. Very cool. Another element that is on your records are beautiful string arrangements. Yeah. Talk about... Um, some of the process for you in creating string arrangements, what have you learned about composing for strings and getting the best and the most out of that? And also, how do you choose the right string players? What have you learned about choosing the right players to make it work? Yeah. Um, yeah, string arrangements, those are really important to me. I, I grew up playing a lot of chamber music, um, like trios and quartets, piano, and then like violin, cello, or violin, cello, viola, or but um, so I, I think I just grew up hearing good string writing and I didn't ever really formally study it, but I, I'm always trying to think about what it is that I'm adding. Like, is it, is it really necessary to the song? And I'd like to think it is. There is one um, style of writing that I, that I incorporated on Negative Truth, um, during my solo, I I left some space in my solo. And then listening back, I was like, I remember the first time I heard this was on Kamazi Washington. He's a sax player. Kamazi Washington's album, The Epic. And he did an arrangement of Claire de Lune, which is actually a Debussy tune, but he arranged in kind of this like gospel 12-8 feel. And he has, I don't know exactly but how he did this, but from the sound of it, it sounded like he recorded the solo and then he wrote a string arrangement or had someone write and record a string arrangement around his solo after the fact. And that's, that's at least the approach that I took for Negative Truth. Because I played the solo and sort of had this, it was like a call and response between the piano and the strings. And so, um, and I, I really tried to think about what was it that I was, like the emotion that I was getting at. And, and, and during that solo, I wanted to take it from sort of this um, reflective kind of beginning where I just, I took where the sax solo ended and sort of started from there. So it really tailed, dovetailed with with him and then sort of built it up to this kind of heroic moment um, over the course of a minute and a half or two minutes. And and the strings were an integral part of making that emotional build happen. And so that was my approach with that. And um, 
And so in terms of the writing, it was just kind of a call and response. And I, I think there is a danger in, <laughs> I joke about this with some arranger friends sometimes about you can tell if a pianist wrote the string arrangement because it's just like a bunch of nice chords moving from, right. and it's, it doesn't always like, the voice leading doesn't really work necessarily in a logical way. But I, I any t- type of arrangement, I'm always thinking about melodies and lines. And so each line, even if it's a four-piece string quartet or if it's like a 25-piece string orchestra, and even if they're doubling, each, each line represents a unique melody. Yeah, and and that's I'm I always think about that. That's central to how I write for strings and in general. But um, they're they're all melodies. They're not just sort of indiscriminate lines that that. So I'm thinking uh, horizontally always. I'm not just thinking vertically from chord as change it, to chord as change. As if the 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 player who's going to play that one viola part, mm-hmm. as if the part itself just sort of moves in a in a way that makes sense Linear. for them across the keyboard exactly or the fingerboard. Right. Um, not like some kind of twisted acrobat having to just like leap all over Definitely weird not. strings and places. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think about it. And one of my tests for that is could each line in that arrangement stand on its own? And whether that means that I just go through it and have Finale or Sibelius play it back, or I sing it through, or I demo it out in Pro Tools or Logic or something and, and hear how it sounds. And it, it can be a very simple melody, but it should still be able to stand on its own. Um, and then to answer the other part of your question, the choosing players, I'm lucky that my, my girlfriend is a great cellist. And so she helps me in, in being discerning on who to call. But um, I think over the years, you get a sense of, of players in town, sort of a trustworthy core. And I mean, these are the, the guys and gals who are being called for the Ocean Way sessions, you know, scoring for Star Wars or some of these major films or TV shows nice. or video game trailers. So they're, they're all trustworthy. And in Nashville, we have a, a lot of great string players. So yeah. I, I, that's, we're all very lucky in that regard. Well, that's cool. Um, you know, what about the tools that go into like, so if somebody's, if you're saying like, if somebody hasn't tried to arrange for strings before and you're like, here's, try these three things. Mm. It was just sort of like, should they just come up with like some sort of string patches and try a few things that, would you recommend play the chords first and then and then break it down into those individual lines and see if the lines go? I mean, I found myself before yeah. not knowing what to do and then just starting with one melody and yeah. then see if I can figure out what goes with that kind of thing. Yeah, I think the the voice leading is the most important part. So I would I would do what you did and um, start with some people, depending on your musical background, might find it easier to start with the top voice. Some people might find it easier to start with a bottom, like more of a bass supporting role mm-hmm. like a cello or something, mm-hmm. which would double a lot of roots or maybe intersect with a lot of fifths. Mm-hmm. Um, but start with one of those and see if you can create a, a, a line of music, a melody that you personally find interesting to yourself. Right. And then then do the other one. So if you started with the bass, then do the melody. And if you started with the melody, then do the bass. And after those first two, you've sort of created your upper and bottom limit. And within that, you can start to weave. Melody some, is often on the note we hear on mm-hmm. top, right? Or no? Yeah, yeah. A lot of times, like the the most prominent melody, and and these are rules that I, I learned in um, in classical theory actually through the years is writing chorale arrangements, and the human voice is similar to a string in that you know you'd want everyone to sort of have a melodic role. Um, whether it's a supporting melodic role or a prominent melodic role, but either way, it's the melody, the line is is the most important thing. Obviously, with um, voices, you got to think more literally about breaths and breathing. Right. Oh, I mean, it was like human voices. Human voices, yeah. yeah. yeah for sure. Whereas for strings, you know, it's nice to have space, but they can just sort of change the bow and keep going. Yeah. Um, those. That's the only major difference between and writing if for a chorale. They're overlapping. You don't notice yeah. as much. Yeah. And there's other rules, you know, but I, I I would say start there and and see where that takes you. You can always, you know, I recommend looking at Beethoven quartets. I think those are. Now, <laughs> when you say looking at them, it's scary. I got, you know, somebody's going to hand me a huge, like, booklet of sheet music. Yeah. Well, there's a cool resource called IMSLP. I think it's through Wikipedia, which is basically just this enormous database of online sheet music completely for free. And it, it has everything after the last hundred years. So from 1920. 
and earlier. And so, of course, that includes Beethoven and Bach and, and all these yeah. great. And you just Google it, IMSLP, or you could just Google Beethoven quartet number, whatever, number five, um, just randomly. And then just look it up and it'll have the sheet music. And if you want to just, because it can be, even if you're not re- literally reading the sheet music, just having a visual aid to see like, how does it visually look? How does right. a quartet, how could it look? Um, and just seeing how it's divided and how lines move and you know how, how when are things moving in parallel motion? When are things moving in contrary motion? One is one staying the same and the other one is moving. Right. And then listening to it. And even if you're not literally reading the music, you can sort of visually link how does it sound? You can find these things on, on, on the internet for free. How does it sound versus how does it look? Oh, I like how that sounds. Well, let me, maybe that's a measure, two measures of music that I'll zero in on. And let me figure out why I like how it sounds. And then let me, let me try to recreate it, whether it's in a vacuum or specific to something I'm working on. I guess it's also really just a reminder that, you know, if you are going to arrange for strings, be prepared to hand the, the string players some sheet music, right? Most, most string players are going to want to be able to read music on a, on a session. Yeah, I think with more complex arrangements, like I did on my record, that's definitely preferable. Um, it kind of goes back to intention. If you're okay with someone else coming up with it for you and you trust them, then great. Yeah. And there are a lot of string players in town who are able to sort of riff in the moment and just sort of improvise their lines as they hear them. Uh, I mean, my girlfriend does that all the time on the cello. And if you put four people together and they're, they really know how how it works, their functions of each of their instruments, it can actually be a very cool thing. Um whether or not you you do everyone at once or you individually stack one at a time okay, is up cool. to you. Um, but if you're very specific, like for me, the reason, a big reason why I wrote it out was because it was the the function of the arrangement was a response to what was already recorded. Right. And so there's a very specific way that I saw that I could weave this quartet within what already was going to like remain yeah, on the recording. Yeah. So there wasn't a lot of margin for for error, if you will, or for ver- variables. Um, it kind of had to remain in that specific function for the entirety of the, of the tune. Um, so that's why I like specifically wrote it out. Um, I think you're going to have a lot better luck if you get someone to write it out for you. Um, and then you hear something and you want to tweak something, great. But let's start with something specific as opposed to just come in and be like, um, well, just do whatever you want. Because right, right, yeah. You I've, might been there. Not, I've tried that before and it's tricky and I'm trying to sing tricky. lines and I can't yeah. sing them. And I, I think both are valid just from where I'm coming from. I prefer writing it out. Yeah. So for somebody who hasn't explored this before, if you have Pro Tools and you can make a MIDI track and, and create some lines there, can we turn those into a score to hand to a string player? Oh, yeah, yeah. You can bounce the MIDI as a file. Um, I do a lot of my creative work like that in Logic. Uh, so I'll speak to that, but you can, it's just a MIDI instrument and it doesn't even matter if it's a, you have the right sound or not. It could just be an acoustic Rhodes or piano or something. You just bounce it as a MIDI file. And then I have a program called Finale, mm-hmm. which is basically like the Microsoft Word, one of two major music notation software programs, Microsoft Word of music notation. Sibelius is the other major one. And there's others that are coming up, smaller ones, but also do the same thing where you just, it'll automatically open up. It's a, the extension is .mid or M-I-D-I, I think. I think it's yeah. .mid. And it'll just open it up and automatically um, just lay it out for you. And you can you can decide if you want it to all be on one staff or if you want it individual staffs. Um, and I, what I would recommend doing is have two versions in whatever creative tool you're using. Like if you're using Pro Tools or Logic, have one where you like how it sounds for a demo purpose, and then have one where you completely quantize it, um, regardless of how it sounds, because it's going to save you a lot of time. Where depending oh, on your settings, yeah, gonna know it, what it will be. Was supposed to be put it will on. be very literal if it's like a thirty-second note early or late. It'll notate that. You're so right. just quantize it a hundred percent, and have the cutoffs specifically where you would want them ahead of time. Yeah, that's a golden tip right there. That's great. Yeah. But that's then great. but then have that one specifically for if you're going to do the notation because right. obviously you want one that sounds 
as good as you can make it for yeah. the purpose of showing the player. Yeah, and then you might um, send the string player um, who's you know leading the quartet or all of them mm-hmm. both of those things in advance of the session so they get a chance to hear. I'm what a it big is. fan of over delivering supporting yeah. materials. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I will like to give them the score, give them the music, and then give them a as good of a demo as I can create, and maybe even have the the string if it's a complex string arrangement, just give it that as a standalone file with a click. Yeah. So they can they can hear it, and if they most most people aren't going to practice it, but if they no, want to, they, one, they have the one option. Listen in their brain, their brain's doing a lot of work from the, in yeah, the background there. Totally. Um, well, dude, that's awesome, man. I think this is a great um, section for us to just close out awesome, the, the podcast Absolutely. interview on. Um, really cool. I'm glad you were able to share all those details. And thanks, and man. Thanks. For I love it me. when we get to the end and you've got like that, like the two versions and the quantize. Like that's a golden takeaway right Sweet. there for anybody who's going to be doing strings. Great. Thank you so much for being on the show with us, man. I got one more question for you. Sure thing. This one is hypothetical, and you're going to take the way back studio machine, and you're going to go back in time. You're going to find young David before you. You know when you when you're either like starting your music and your composition. Maybe it's before your first record, your first recording experience, and you want to go back and give yourself one bit of advice. And you say, "Listen, dude, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the recording studio yourself one day." What advice would you like to go back and give yourself? Wow, that's a great question. And I know that's, you know, that the context could yeah. offer a lot of answers, but maybe it's, again, it's the context of like going in, trying to make, make a, a great record. Yeah, sure. I would say, um, first of all, I would say don't do anything differently. <laughs> and second, I would also say, Play your music as much as possible before you record it. Yeah. Um, and that could mean a couple times, that could mean dozens of times. But play your music as often as you can before you record it and with with great musicians. Don't be intimidated just because this guy has toured the world and you think he's he's way better than you. Like surround yourself with really great musicians and play with them as often as you can and and just be teachable and open to whatever feedback they have because yeah. it's going to inform the way that you construct your arrangements going into the studio um, at a really deep level. And, um, and I would add to that, get in the studio as early as possible. Like, like find people who are, maybe it's just a friend who, who's starting up his own um, recording studio who's, who's willing to have you in for free, who just wants to test some sounds and stuff. But start learning about the other side like for me, I'm primarily a, a player and a studio guy, but I will, I love nerding out on, on the mixing end and learning about plugins and, and different approaches to recording and, and microphones yeah. and, and gear and all that stuff as well. So learning as much about the other side as possible. Um, so really with the goal of being able to communicate with the, with the engineer and being able to express your ideas um, I, I hear that that's helpful a lot of times. You know, it's a lot nicer to be able to say, you know, could you, would you be able to high pass that for me instead of, that's too muddy, it's too med, it's too dark, you know, or or something like that. Be as specific as possible, but you can't be specific if you don't know what you're being specific right, about. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah, I give you a few things. I think, I think any of those things I would, would tell myself. Yeah, just get in the studio and get your hands dirty. Try yeah. some stuff. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, no. And I like that putting yourself, I like great advice about practicing a bunch. Yeah. I learned that going into the studio to do my record. Like, I was like, crap, I don't even know how to play my own songs. Right. How, how am I going to rely on the band to play really well if I can't even play really well with them? You know? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, don't be afraid to play with people that you're like, this is scary because they're better than me. Oh, yeah. Well, that's how you're going to grow. That's how you're going to grow the the quickest. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, just don't be afraid of the tools. No. Don't be afraid to learn the language. Yeah. Don't, I think we're, we don't live in an age anymore where, I mean, the information's all there. And especially in Music City, the people are all around you. Um, and here in Nashville, and probably a lot of other cities too. But the, the expertise is all around you. So yeah. lean into that and yeah. ask for advice. Yeah. 
access to information doesn't mean you get to bypass the hard work, but no, it does no, no, mean no. you got access to all the right information. Yeah. It just means you got a fast track to working hard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fast track to get kicking your own ass. Exactly. Awesome, dude. Well, what a pleasure having you on the show, Thanks, dude. Lidge. Super fun My to hang pleasure. out with you and, and really get deep into the whole philosophy of yeah, making man. music and everything. Love it. Um, let the rock stars know how they can find you online. Where should they go pick up doorways and songs for generation. Absolutely. Yeah, you can, you can check out my website. It's kind of the central watering hole for all my social media. It's www.davidrogers, David M. Rogers, D-A-V-I-D-M-R-O-D-G-E-R-S, like Dodgers with a uh, R at the front, dot com, uh, davidmrogers.com. And I'm on Facebook, my artist page, David M. Rogers Music, as well as Instagram at dr4j. Um, oh, also, why don't you give a shout out to your improv show? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm doing for the last year plus. I've been doing a, a podcast, my own video podcast called the Improvisers Corner, which is on YouTube. Uh, I have my YouTube channel there, and each month I highlight um, various member of the Nashville music community who is deep into improvisation and not not just jazz. I've had a, a great singer songwriter on Jess Nolan, uh, Daniel Sauls, D Jam, doing his more electronic stuff. So it's improvisation and how it infiltrates all sorts of different kinds of music here in Music City. And um, of course, my own stuff is on uh, Spotify, Apple Music, all the digital streaming sites, um, iTunes Store, anywhere where you can find music, you could find me. Awesome, dude. And Rockstars, of course, I've got links in the show notes too, so you can just click through and go straight to all those things. So please click through. Please go check out the video playlist I put together for you so you can go hear the records we had the pleasure of doing. And hopefully there's more coming. Yes, sir. All right, dude. Thanks, thanks for Liz. being here, dude. We'll see you soon. Cheers. All right. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, PreSonus, Spectra 1964, and API Audio. You will find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. So thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.